number 10, the creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted a Literally. He just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period. So if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. Number eight, the first victim. Miraculously, only six people died in the Great Fire of 1666. That's amazing. I mean, obviously it's horrible, of course, and that's still a great loss of life, but this fire destroyed four-fifths of London, yet somehow the death toll was below 10 people. That's wild. I don't want to put the blame on one person here, but we kind of have to. Yeah, one baker left the oven ablaze, and his name was Thomas Fariner. And as I mentioned earlier, he was the king's baker. Sometime around midnight, only a couple hours after he went to bed, these hot embers ignited firewood, lying next to the oven. He didn't check thoroughly enough and then the rest is history. Now, Fariner thankfully managed to escape with his family as well as a servant. They all escaped through a window at the top floor, but the baker's assistant was sadly the first victim. Number seven, a desperate flea. So once this fire began, there was no stopping, right? The fire department, I'll explain more of that in a bit, they couldn't stop this raging fire. Nobody could. Citizens fled and ran down to the Thames River and their goal was to escape the smoke and chaos by boat, hopefully. Now, a few Londoners were brave and they stuck around. A handful of citizens assisted local soldiers carrying buckets of water, splashing water on anything and everything. They were doing anything they could, but ultimately they were ordered to leave as the flames would burn on for days longer. Number six, stopping the blaze. This blaze was so bright you could see it from 30 miles away, okay? It was horrible, but it was quite a spectacle. It took days to get this under control, and the way they did so was by purposely igniting buildings that had gunpowder in their storage on fire. Yeah, the reaction caused the building to, of course, blow to smithereens, meaning that there's now nowhere else for said fire to travel. Yeah, let's stop this fire by igniting a few controlled fires. Sounds bad on paper, but it was the only solution available at the time. And we still do this today, to a degree. You know, we don't blow up any buildings, but we're like, eh, we'll just cut off this crop right here. Number five. Fake news. The amount of questions that were pouring in after this, I mean, how did this happen? Who started the fire? What do we do now? Are we all f***ed? What's happening? Desperate souls were seeking answers. Now, in the following years, around the 1670s, a monument column was put up near the blaze's origin. We believe it was designed by architect Robert Hooke, but some cases source Christopher Wren. Now, it's important to note their names or include them because on this actual column, over 200 feet tall, full of engravings and sculptures, all that good historic stuff, Stuff. On this column, it told the story of what went wrong that fateful day. And it wasn't exactly accurate now, was it? The fire was due to the hand of God 
a great wind, and a very dry season. Yeah, that's it, just bad luck, I guess. An inscription on the monument has thankfully been removed since 1830, but it actually blamed the disaster on the treachery and malice of the Popish faction. Yeah, you did this. He's like, what? I was asleep, what? Cut to 1986, a little further away, London's baker finally took the blame and apologized to the Lord Mayor for setting fire to the city. Yeah, a little late, but we'll all accept it, thank you. Members of the worshipful company of bakers gathered on Pudding Lane, they unveiled a plaque to Thomas Fariner. And it was the, he was guilty of causing the Great Fire, 1666, yeah. It wasn't a great wind, it wasn't the hand of God. It was Thomas. Let's all get it straight. Number four. Damage control. In total, the fire took out 13,000 houses, 90 churches, and most famously, the old St. Paul's Cathedral was destroyed. The people that did escape with only a few belongings, well, now they were homeless. It was horrible. It's estimated that 100,000 people were just left on the streets. King Charles II acted quickly. He was dead set on rebuilding, of course, after this point, right away. And that's when the legendary architect Sir Christopher Wren entered the picture. He designed a new St. Paul's Cathedral with dozens of smaller churches spaced around it in order to prevent future fires. That was the goal here. That's the city that we now recognize today. It was the result of a massive hazard, right? We're looking at a big safety map. We don't even realize it. Now we look back after this tragedy and the following houses were made of brick or stone or, you know, something. Something better than tar and wood, you know what I mean? And London streets became even wider to prevent spread of a further flame. Even so, fire departments weren't actually active until the 18th century, which is still wild. Number three, backup plans. So what if this happened again? We need to prepare, right? This almost ruined London. Well, this was a business opportunity as well, right? Of course. Insurance companies hit the market. Hey, if another blaze takes out four fifths of your land, you're gonna need a couple bucks, right? Eh, come buy some insurance. We got your back. That was the commercial, you know? Just on a wagon. Hey, we got your back. It's easy. Instead of a little gecko insurance guy, it's just like a little knight. You could hire your own fire brigade in case shit goes south. Nicholas Barbin created London's first insurance company, appropriately named the Fire Office. Other companies followed, and by 1690, one in 10 houses in London had insurance. We love a good business structure, post-apocalyptic biblical blaze. Keep it up, guys. Number two, nursery rhymes. Just like any other major event in history, you gotta make a song about it, right? Or at least include it in a verse or two. We love historical references, especially with a sick beat. Awesome, cool. Now, Jay-Z hasn't mentioned the Great Fire of 1666. Not yet, or at least not to my knowledge. But there is a popular nursery rhyme about it called London's Burning. It's a pretty on-the-nose title for a nursery rhyme surrounding a great tragedy, but okay. The Clash as well, they have songs referencing London's downfall, and there's even a TV show called London's Burning, and it centers around firefighters in London. It's a pretty good one. I saw a clip and I was like, eh, this is pretty intense. It's good stuff. And finally, number one, Nostradamus predictions. Yeah, who knew we were warned about this great blaze the entire time? Nostradamus, the Bible, everyone's calling this shit. Many religions have influenced the public belief of the end of the world, and this one's from all the way back before the 1600s. Now in the Bible, it references the number 666 as the number of the beast. So many Christians in Europe, back in the 1600s, they believed that the world was going to end sometime around 1666. And then this happens, they're like, uh, is this it? What the Fast forward to that year, September of 1666, the Great Fire of London actually happened. So many saw this as the prophecy of the end of the world coming true. I mean, of course, thousands of people fleeing to the river with their belongings, what else does that look like? On the bright side of all this, pun not intended, with all the property damage here, the death toll for this Great Fire was only six people. It wasn't exactly the end of the world, but it was for those six, sadly. And this happened on the year of the beast. Coincidence, or did the Bible actually predict the blaze? Number 10. We are dumb. Yes, yes we are. Who would have thought that dumping tons upon tons of human and animal waste into a river would be perfectly fine? You see, the sewer system in London, England prior to this happening was not a good system to put it mildly. Human poop would often be pumped into cesspits, tanks and big old holes that would quickly fill up and run off into the streets through culverts that ran down the streets. Or the yummy wet waste would seep into people's basements and foundations creating pockets of methane that would cause explosions from time to time. I'm really trying to understand why anyone thought this was a good idea. Maybe they just thought, ah, nothing bad has happened yet. The advances in plumbing, including flushable toilets, literally just made the whole thing worse. All the sewage that did successfully go into the system, which was meant for rainwater, was pumped out into the River Thames, and even some sources of drinking water. I am instantly upset. Number nine, 
washed away to sea. Now to be completely fair, all of this poop, animal poop and industrial waste finding its way into the sewers and out into the river were believed to flow directly into the ocean where I guess they just assumed it would disperse and not be a big problem. But the real problem is it didn't actually flow out to sea. No, it, it actually dispersed among the river thanks to the tidal nature of said river. Which meant, for centuries, the river was being injected with more and more and more sewage. Which seeped into the ground all around the giant open sewer river that in the summer of 1858 all bubbled up to the surface thanks to the heat and released its lovely malodorous stench for all those far and wide around the city of London to sniff up. And what of feces? What do these highly civilized, highly sanitary individuals have to offer us for the call of nature? The modern toilet didn't exist back in the 14th century. Instead, you either had a closed stool, which was a special seat with a bucket underneath, or you used a privy, which is a seat with a hole in it. So why not call them the same thing? Whatever, medieval people. Waste going through the closed stool, which by the way is where we get the feces nickname stool, was collected in the bucket, which was then removed, emptied, washed, and replaced. Waste that passed through the sea of a privy, which was the early kind of toilet, ended up in one of two places. If the castle had a moat around it, the waste probably would have gone in there. If it didn't have a moat, or if the privy was located somewhere without access to water, bodily waste ended up in a cesspit at the very bottom of the castle. But anyways, check out what some of the privies looked like. From what I gathered reading, there really were some castles without designated rooms for these. Just could find them in random hallways in case you want to whip it out and take a leak right there. At Paravrail Castle, you often find privies privies high up in the wall, high above the smell and safe from attackers who might use the literal crap hole to get into the castle like a reverse Shawshank escape. The most famous example of this allegedly took place during the siege of Chateau Galliard in 1204. Talk about a crappy job, it's the royal bleep shoveler. You know the word, it rhymes. So cesspit, the medieval crap dungeon thing. Though medieval people didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells caused illnesses, meaning when the stank started wafting up a little too hard, one unfortunate man would have have to clean it out. Like rich people nowadays scheduling a maid, whenever this dude showed up, everyone in the castle would hightail it out so as to not have to interact. The gong farmer would shovel the poop into baskets and wheelbarrows and take it off to bury or spread on fields as fertilizer for the food they ate. Gong farming could be dangerous. In 1325, Richard the Raker fell into a cesspit and drowned. Say goodbye to sinus and sense of smell as the acids cook that out of you. And stay away from the infectious bacteria literally everywhere. However, gong farmers were quite well paid despite people not wanting to ever get close to them due to their smell. Rest assured though, because castle logic was that closets and toilets are one of the same. The private castle privy was always sharing the same space as the residents stowed away personal belongings and a room called garter robes. Obviously you can see this is a stepping stone to a wardrobe being a sequestered small offshoot room. Inside the garter robe was also a toilet hole next to your Sunday best. Logic dictated clothes should be kept close to the toilet to prevent insects from damaging them. The idea being that the odor would act as a deterrent for insects. Fecal odor. Okay. And what makes all of this so much better is that you never have a second alone. If you haven't caught onto the theme here yet, it is plain and simple. Castle life meant cramped quarters. It took a lot of people to keep a castle running. There were cooks, cleaners, guards, personal servants, and of course all the royalty as well. Plus, the royals that lived in the castle extended past the nuclear family. It was their extended families as well. As a result, most of the rooms were multifunctional and the keep was the primary living space in the castle. Soldiers, servants, and even lords and ladies in waiting were expected to sleep in groups segregated by the sexes. For example, the women may have slept in bedchambers while the male servants, courtiers, and soldiers may have slept in the great hall. Even lords and ladies of castles often shared a room with a servant of the same sex. So why is that gross? Religious and royal obligation to reproduce. Also people without an obligation who would really like to do it anyway. As long as those people are married, you actually couldn't complain. In fact, it's weirder if you saw something and said something. So if everything stinks and you got next to no windows, how do you make a minty fresh castle? The simple answer is they didn't. Mold, insect, vermin, and disease were all part of everyday life in medieval times. Fresh water was precious and a reliable disinfectant was yet to be discovered. Eating a little bit of mold on your food or stepping in rooms with moldy walls were minor problems compared to actually finding enough food to eat and fighting off hungry wild animals like wolves or not dying of the plague 
or not being accused of witchcraft, there's bigger fish to fry. People in Norman and Tudor England lived short lives. If you reached the age of 40, you were considered old. Castles were very difficult to keep clean. There was no running water, so even simple washing tasks meant carrying lots of bucketfuls of water from a well or a stream. Few people had the luxury of being able to bathe regularly. The community back then was generally more tolerant of smell as a result. Inside the castle walls, floor coverings consisted of straw rushes and later sweet smelling herbs like lavender and mint. This could be swept away and replaced when it was of a noticeable point of filth. It was said that an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty was seen when the soiled herbs were swept up and exchanged for fresh ones. But you know what doesn't help a castle? The smell of rotting corpses. Ah, luxury. There are heads of enemies cooking in the sun on spikes right outside your fresh air slit. There's the remains of a peasant shredded by mad dogs in the courtyard below, and someone is literally rotting just to your left in the wall. Castles were riddled with the dead. In the case of an oubliette, they were quite literally riddled. An oubliette is basically a little coffin cave thing dug into a wall, where a particularly hated prisoner could be tossed in, bricked up, and completely forgotten about. Fittingly, oubliette comes from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Given some of the other medieval death options, I guess starving to death bricked into a rat infested hole wasn't the worst way to go. It still was way creepier to think that on any given day a castle had people rotting in its figurative basements and walls. Must have been for great ghost stories though, not great for the smell of their decomposing body quite literally wafting up through the floorboards later. Next up is how horrible it would have been to be a lady on the rack. So ladies have periods and they need some way to handle the men's seas mess without the feminine hygiene products we have today. This ain't the Victorian era where it was commonplace to weirdly free bleed everywhere. Medieval women preferred one of two choices. She could always catch the flow after it left her body or find a way to absorb it internally. In our modern words, medieval women could use a makeshift pad or a makeshift tampon. Pads were made of a scrap fabric or rag, thus the whole on the rag thing. Cotton was preferred because the material absorbs fluid better than the alternative wood, which not only repels liquid, but it's itchy and uncomfortable. Whether they made the choice of a homemade pad or homemade tampon, medieval women worried about leaks and stains. This is the main reason why red was a popular medieval petticoat color. The scarlet color was not only fashionable and decorative, but functional to disguise leaks. Now, the period ain't what's gross, it never is. It's what wealthy castle dwelling women could afford to block said period that was gross. A common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England, Sophagun simifibulolian, was a remarkably absorbent material. Ladies stuffed their homemade pads and tampons with it, and folks even used it as toilet paper or as battlefield dressing. The popular name for this moss is blood moss. Entomologists contend that this moniker comes from its use in battlefield first aid. This account, of course, oozes heroism and masculinity. In reality, it earned the name from being used in menses and shoved up there. And definitely my favorite on the list today is protection wasn't just armor. One of the most interesting castle finds includes the protection discovered in Dudley Castle in 1885. Dating from the early 1600s, they're the earliest definitive physical evidence of the use of animal membrane jimmy hats in post medieval Europe. The enact deposits uncovered during excavations contained both domestic and organic remains of the occupying royalists who defended the castle under siege between 1642 and 1646. The keep's latrines had been sealed during the demolition of the castle's defenses in 1647. Examining further, scientists were able to determine that five blackened jimmy hats had been used and a further five non-blackened ones were presumably unused, all folded in on one another. The Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum boasts that their significance was magnified due to the nature of the find and the extraordinary archaeological cir circumstances in which they were found. Who might have used them is unknown, however the complexity of the manufacture must have made them relatively expensive, so perhaps the preserve of an officer class. It's known that officers wives were present during the royalist occupation, however this discovery definitely testifies this was neither the time nor place to pop out a kid. Stay safe and use protection y'all. Starting us off at number 10 we have men producing milk. I have nipples, Greg. Could you milk me? 
Yeah, that's right. Women aren't the only ones who can produce milk. Nipples develop early on in the womb before the embryo becomes distinctly male or female. So it turns out that men also have mammary glands, aka the organ that is responsible for producing milk. Now, even though men can produce milk, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's usually a sign of something wrong. Most commonly, it happens when there is an interference with prolactin, the hormone needed to produce milk. So while we can do this, it sounds like we don't want this to happen. So be sure to see a trusted doctor in case this does happen. So look after your body, folks. You only get one. Coming in at our number nine spot, we have men usually have darker hair than women. That's right. If you ever made the assumption that men always have darker hair, you know, more than women, well, you're kind of right, but there, of course, there are always a few exceptions. Think of the amount of blonde males you know compared to the amount of blonde females you know. You probably know a few more blonde females. Now, according to Joseph Hart, RN, Doctor of Operations at Maxim Hair Restoration, he says men typically have darker hair than their female counterparts, particularly once the individual has passed through puberty and his trend will continue with age. He also says that this phenomenon is due to men's higher levels of melanin which can influence people's skin color, hair color and even eye color. Now this one actually makes sense to me because my little brother growing up was always a blondie but in around his like teenage years his hair slowly got darker and you know what he became less cute. Love you bro. But before we get to his love life and kiddos, let's learn about how Frisky runs in the family. It's well known that Henry's older brother, the first husband of Henry's first wife, Catherine, died young. But did you know he had two royal sisters who made his life a living hell for fun? Henry's older sister, Margaret, was just as feisty as her brother. She was sent to Scotland to marry that country's king, James IV, at just 13. She did produce an heir after a couple years, the future James V, but her crappy adulterous playboy spouse didn't live terribly long. So as a single queen, Margaret wanted to keep up her luxe lifestyle at her brother Henry's expense, which he did not love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but she fell for and married another Scottish noble, the Earl of Angus. Henry's other sister, Mary, had some equally troublesome marriage issues, at least for Henry. He married her first to the elderly King Louis of France, but that monarch passed away very shortly after. A smart woman who recognized being married to a literal senior could kind of work in her favor, made Henry promise her before her marriage if she was to be widowed, her next husband would be a man of her own choosing. Henry agreed, which hilariously was a bad idea but only for him because now a widow, Mary chose to wed a commoner who was Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon. The king was furious that Mary would marry against his will since he had no intention of keeping his promise to her and that her second wedding took away the opportunity for him to make alliances using her. But Mary and Brandon told him to suck it and stayed married till her death. Their descendants included the Lady Jane Grey, the infamous Nine Day Queen. And before he went around dismantling religions to get some nookie, Henry was a devout choir boy. You might know Henry as the king who split from Rome and brought around the Anglican faith, but in his youth, Henry was a vehement supporter of Catholicism and its head. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new palace. He supported the papacy and in 1521 even published a book-length slam poem against the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. He referred to Luther as a venomous serpent, a pernicious plague, an inferal wolf, an infectious soul, a detestable trumpeter of pride, calamities, and schism. In recognition of Henry's forceful piety, Pope Leo the X, I can't remember that number, awarded him the title of Fidi de Defensier, aka Defender of the Faith. Henry was actually going to join the church himself before his older brother Arthur died and left him a throne and a wife to take care of. Scarcely a decade after being called Defender of Faith, Henry led a schism of his own, cleaving the Church of England into the wider Catholic Church after the Pope Clement refused to annul Henry's 16 year marriage to Catherine. Oh, it's time, y'all, because you may have known he was a womanizer, but did you know Henry was also a consistent king? What do I mean? Have you guys ever paid attention to the names of his wives? So, they were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. So it went Catherine, Anne, Jane, Anne, Catherine, Catherine. I feel like if Henry had lived longer, there would have been another Anne and a Jane that would have come along and then another Catherine Catherine. Ironically, Jane Seymour, the middle wife and the only unique name in the bunch, was Henry's favorite. But more on that sappy tale in a bit. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. When Henry's older brother died, he inherited a kingdom and a wife, Catherine, and they remained married for nearly 24 years. During that time, Catherine was faithful to Henry, but Henry was sticking 
taken it in any lady he could find, except Anne Boylan, who made him wait. So his answer, annul a whole marriage just to get some. But as mentioned, Pope wouldn't do that, so Henry had to start a whole new religion just so he could. Guess he shouldn't have done that, because Henry gets so desperate to end the relationship with Anne, he makes up allegations, maybe history's rocky on that, of adultery and treason, and had the marriage annulled and her beheaded. Jane had served as a lady-in-waiting to both Catherine and Anne, and I kid you not, Anne and Jane had gotten in actual fistfights because of Anne's jealousy, so just picture a 15th century cat fight. On October 12th, 1537, Jane gave birth to Edward, their only male heir, and then died from complications due to the birth several weeks later. This is the only woman Henry had actually truly loved, and the loss decimated him for two years. His next wife, another Anne, catfished him with her portrait. Turns out she's ugly, and they amicably divorce after six months, so she lives out her life in comfy luxury in the country. Smart woman. The next Catherine was all young and hot at the time when Henry was repugnant and unable to walk, and it was more of a classic sugar baby situation. She cheated a bunch and got beheaded. The final Catherine was a grown up mature adult woman, shockingly a widow or two, and of all of Henry's wives, Catherine had the most influence on the court culture, religion, and role of women, and she also persuaded Henry to restore his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to the order of succession. When you marry at that many women, however, it's actually easy to see where his heart laid. Years before his death, Henry made plans to build a monumental tomb for himself, but also Jane Seymour. She truly was his favorite queen, the one woman he definitely loved, and the mother of his only surviving male heir. Henry went as far as to confiscate a black marble sarcophagus that was originally intended for the powerful churchman Cardinal Walsley to be used at the center of their tomb. The monumental tomb was in the works for most of his time on the throne, but during the tumultuous years after his death in 1547, it was never completed. So Henry and Jane were left to rest in peace in what was going to be temporary lodgings in Windsor Castle until said monument was all wrapped up. But it never did, and the kingdom was so bankrupt that it didn't really ever come around. So completing it seemed a little impractical. It had been a long time, and Henry's intended tomb is now actually home to another famous figure. Two and a half centuries later, the sarcophagus became part of an ornate national monument, the final resting place of Horatio Nelson, the great British naval hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anyways, on to his children, because these poor guys were nearly victims of their dad's dirty plan. For the longest time, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, so he decided to concoct what, had it come to fruition, might have been the grossest marriage ever. Although I feel like the Habsburgs would hear that sentence and as a challenge say, hold my beer. Anyways, Jane may have popped out Henry's only official heir, but he did have an illegitimate son by his mistress. Henry Fitzroy, a surname that literally means son of the king, so a hilarious thing to name your bastard child, was named Duke of Richmond. In order to ensure that his country didn't descend into literal war again over lack of male heir, King Henry wanted Fitzroy to be the next monarch. How may you ask? Why marry the boy to his half-sister Mary? This plan got so close to fruition that the cup already had the green light from the Pope. Thankfully, Fitzroy was in love and married someone else. When Fitzroy died at age 17, it left the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne. Thankfully, as mentioned, Jane ensured both daughters as well as the son got their chance. And speaking of Fitzroy's half-sister, Bloody Mary, she wasn't the only family member that wasn't all there. Henry the heck dick is next. It's widely known that quite a few of these famous noble and aristocratic lines were also plagued by mental illness. Various theories have pointed at Henry's syphilis and brain injuries as possible causes. After all, it would be logical to assume that the damage occurred to the frontal lobes from having a horse buck him off twice. That region of the brain processes impulse control, external cues from other actions, and social and lustuous behavior. He also began to comfort eat around this period. Everyone's heard of that person who's had a stroke and just wasn't the same afterwards. So brain damage likely could be the explanation. In 2020, researchers actually discovered what they believe is the site where Henry received the blow to his head that could have caused traumatic brain injury. But it might come down to hereditary psychiatric problems in the family. His paternal great grandmother, Catherine of Valois, was the daughter of the famously mentally ill King Charles III. Her family's psychiatric issues seem to have been passed down through generations to multiple British monarchs. In his later years, Henry had a significant personality shift towards paranoia, fits of rage, depression, and anxiety. And he sent crowds of prisoners to the Tower of London. He sent more men and women to their deaths than any other English monarch and estimated 57 to 72,000 people. Yikes. Dictator numbers. But one thing about Henry, no matter how unhealthy homeboy got, he earned that chub. Huge misconception. Henry was only morbidly obese in the last few years of his life. For a long time before that, however, he was one of the most handsome and hella fit men of his era. Dude was well over six foot and had a 34 inch waist. In 1536, Henry was taking part in a tournament when he fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, leaving the king unconscious for several hours and forever altering his cheerful, outgoing personality. This is the second horse related mass head injury Henry sustained. After this injury and the further ulcer development in his legs, Henry was left pretty much an 
unable to exercise. His made to measure suits of armor chart the king's expansion with his final set around 1540, suggesting he weighed more than 300 pounds with a waist of 54 inches. As a matter of fact, Henry was so overweight he needed a mechanical device to help him get in and out of bed. When he died in 1547, he weighed nearly 400 pounds with a 60 inch waist. Impressive in a time before 10 cheeseburgers for $10, but I mean, if you're over 50, ruled a kingdom, injured his health for around 30 years, you can just let go. Who cares? And last, but never the least, Henry was a hypochondriac king. Henry was obsessed with sickness and disease, specifically the sweating sickness and the plague. This is pretty fair. By the age 30, he'd already caught smallpox and malaria a couple times. Anytime there was an outbreak of anything, he would minimize his risk of infection by straight up leaving London and limiting the number of ambassadors he saw. Even when Anne Boleyn caught the sweating sickness in 1528, Henry said peace and stayed far away until she got better. Henry, bad husband. Good infection minimizer though. Naturally, like any germaphobe, Henry was doing the most to feel clean. So he was known to self-medicate. He even wrote his own prescription book, which detailed how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. He diagnosed himself with so many illnesses and disorders that it was actually hard to keep track of all of them. From migraines to insomnia and gout, Henry's life was spent dealing with and or avoiding various different diseases and ailments. Despite his many tyrannical qualities, Henry wasn't all that bad. He actually improved English medicine due to his outlandish paranoias, bringing the country further into the renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, the king also passed seven different laws to control the practice of medicine. In 1540, Henry pushed through one of the earliest laws to regulate drugs. Apothecary wares had to be checked to make sure no one was defrauding honest customers. His reign also contributed to the increase of supervision of sewers, thanks to his chancellor and future victim, Sir Thomas More, who drastically improved the quality of London's public water supply. Number 10 will be Charlie Chapman's casting couch. Want, want, want. Sorry to break the news, but Charlie Chapman, the man whose face you know, but movies you don't, pioneered this notorious and derogatory element of showbiz, which Charlie intended, at his history collections writes, as a way of powerful Hollywood figures extracting explicit favors from actresses during auditions. Charlie had a long history of aggressive behavior towards women, especially in his sketches. Things went from sinister to surreal and then back to sinister again, as actresses endured slapstick ordeal as well as emotional and physical torment behind the scenes, especially because Charlie had a penchant for seeking physical relationships with co-stars, even if they didn't want one with him. In fact, he ensured many women to had to sleep with him, even without their consent, and children even came of it, which he would consecutively ignore. His alarming interests eventually led him to straight up leaving the USA. After preying on multiple wives and women younger than him, Charlie settled with 18 year old Una when he was 54. They have eight children together and remain married until Charlie's death. Did this change anything about his bad behavior? No, he was horrible to her. He was horrible to his kids. He treated them as servants to his ego. And in the words of Marlon Brando, Chaplin was probably the most sadistic man I'd ever met. Next up is the poet and the painter Caravaggio, number nine. He was probably the world's most famous Baroque painters, his shadowy works reflecting what he felt was the nature of man, but also himself. Caravaggio had lived an extremely difficult life, and it built the man into a hell of an addict. Drinking, gambling, intercourse, and violence were all an appetite he didn't seem to be able to satiate, even once he killed somebody. Yeah, that's right, homie literally killed a dude. Ironically, what ended up with him in front of a judge was attack poems written against a rival artist, Baglion. However, Caravaggio's real physical victim was one Ranuccio Tosonani, who had apparently been cut on the groin, which in modern terms means Caravaggio cut the stock removed an appendage, catch my drift. Why did he do this? Great question, we don't even know. Through savage details, they, it suggests a woman was involved and art historian Andrew Graham Dixon, who speculates it was a uh, typical type of retaliation should the attacker feel his beloved had been wronged. And that definitely backs this theory up. In other words, Tolsonani likely shaded Caravaggio's girlfriend and wound up with a wince-inducing consequence. Well. Speaking of wild stuff, how about some messed up Gaga fashion? Since to quote, makeup and paint are things that the light women use as shameless creatures according to one source, you can imagine the women here weren't repping that colonial style of 12 layers of poison powder on their faces. But some Mexica women stained their teeth red with the crushed bodies of cochinal insects to make themselves more essentially appealing. Which multiple sources say that Mexica men didn't actually like colored teeth, so I guess makeup isn't always for you, is it fella? 
gorillas. Companions of warriors often rubbed yellow wax or earth all over their face and body, dyed their feet, and painted their hands and neck with intricate designs. That the fellas liked. Some women who worked in temples dyed their long hair with a red hue and their teeth black. They'd also etch complex designs onto their bodies. Priests painted their bodies black or covered them with ash. Black and grey were associated with the wisdom of spirits. Speaking of fellas, their unique beauty side was lip plug. The size and shape of the piece placed in the slit of their lip indicated the warrior's success. Earplugs were also a trend, but for both sexes, and now for wannabe goth 14 year olds trying to piss off dad. Sometimes you just want to get rid of the feeling of someone on your skin. Well, the Mashika believed you could wash them off. Upon the death of a loved one, Mashika would often enter states of deep, ritualized mourning. For instance, the death of a merchant would mean that his family was plunged into an elaborate days long ritual to mark his passing, such as mourning screams. For widows, mourning their husband could get frankly pretty gross. A Mashika woman mourning her husband lost to war would enter an extraordinary 80 day period of grief. During this time, she would not wash her face, head, or clothes. The accumulated filth expressed her deep emotion during the time it took for her husband's spirit to reach paradise. If you remember point two, you'll know what takes hella long for souls to get some peace. After this time, she was to get up, clean herself off, pull up the big girl pants, and having ritualistically washed the evidence of the sorrel off her body, move on in life, find someone new, and start over, homegirl. Kidnap someone, or you're a loser, is a literal real thing for the Mashika. Even though biology decides when the ball will drop and you become a man, to the Mashika, a boy wasn't a man until he had captured another person in literal battle. Till then, guess what, wimpy, you're a disgraceful child and everyone will make sure everyone else knows it. It starts at age 10 when your parents drag you outside the apartment with the trimmers and buzz you bald, except for a tuft. Tuft could be placed anywhere, so depending on how much your parents hate you, the spot could be pretty stupid. From then on, you're forbidden from cutting that tuft, until the day he defeated and returned an enemy to the empire. Didn't mean he couldn't grow out the rest of his hair, but that one stupid shame tuft is always going to be sticking out so that the mean ass girl you had a crush on could destroy your spirit by shouting, is it a stinking tuft of hair? Thou are not a woman like me? As a result, it was a fairly common for the boys who were only supposed to be carrying supplies at the battlefield to rush into the heat of battle and try to set fire someone to capture. More often than not, those boys ended up dead, but if they survived, they'd come home as heroes. And if they die on the field, well, the soldier's afterlife ain't that bad, as you know. And what did they battle with? Why, only the worst weapon imaginable. Each ancient Mashika weapon was unique and used for a specific purpose, as Mashika warfare was highly organized, complex affair steeped in ritual and tradition. The most devastating weapon used by the Mashika warriors was the Mahiko, which means hungry wood. Oh yeah, hardcore. While the Mahikas were advanced, in many ways, one technology they didn't develop was foraging, so they had no metal weapons. So obviously, they were using something stronger. And no, it's not aliens, for Christ's sake. The flat oak wooden panel of the Maku was embedded with razor sharp slivers of obsidian, which is 12 times sharper than surgical steel, and you had the option of being one handed or two. They were about three to four feet long and wide, and a two hander could be even bigger, and you swung them in a dragging motion. Apparently, the weapon was powerful enough to decapitate a human from Mashika texts, and according to the report from invading Spaniards, a Mashika warrior even used one of these to decapitate a horse in one blow. So they tested on the television show Deadliest Warrior, and it lived up to the test. This one dances the lines between messed up and actually kind of sweet. It's taken to the shield. So the Mashikas have often been mistaken as highly patriarchal as they are well dominated by war in its mentality, which is presumed to be the domain of men, especially historically. But though most soldiers were men, sacrifice and battle are central to the ways that Mashikas viewed the world. So Mashika women's lust could be openly enjoyed and expressed within marriage, and they were able to marry at age 16, not a single damn day before. And as someone who talks about history, I think it's the first time I've said that to this camera. But what makes women so unique in this culture is that once they're married, mothers and warriors are seen as equals. Mashika culture had a beautiful notion that women were also warriors, battling to capture a baby, heralded as soldiers returning from the war having taken to the shield. And it wasn't just a metaphor, dying during childbirth earn privileges in the afterlife equivalent to dying on battle or on the sacrificial stone as mentioned in point two. Women who struggled with fertility were not seen and punished for it, but rather the strongest of them all. As soldiers continue to return from battle, she continues to fight nature. This parallel between war
warriors and mothers reflects the balanced gender expectations. The Mexicas believed that men and women played specific but different roles that were equally essential for the success of their city. Thus, both sexes had importance and effectiveness, but in very different spheres. So from the perspective of invading colonialists, they may not be messed up to us, but to them, straight F. Want to know what is messed up? Ferocious gods require praise 24-7 if you don't want to get smoked. Why? Because the Mexicas believe that the beginning of the fifth age of the world, their new age, was delivered by the gods' heroic sacrifices of themselves. Their spilt blood brought humans to life, created the sun, and gave energy to the moon. And so a blood debt has been born, and only human blood and hearts could keep the sun moving and save the world from extinction. So you're not trying to piss them off. Priests were straight up taught to alienate their loved ones, conditioning them to perform rituals precisely and unquestioningly under extreme stress. AKA, when you get asked to sacrifice your homeboy, you gotta be unbiased. Ooh, another, nobles use cactus vines to lance their earlobes and also to bleed themselves in pyramid shrines as offerings to the gods. When the Aztec forces, Mexicas, were on the campaign, a wife would rise at midnight, conduct a precise series of rituals at home and in the temples to ensure his success. Not kidding, but sweeping was one of those rituals, apparently helping control the world's filth, keeping cosmos in balance, and ensuring the favors of the gods. So what am I telling you? That in a spiritual sense, the Mexica fully believed that it was this domestic space on the home front where battles were believed to be won and lost. So you better be getting up eight times a night, sacrificing hearts as a community, and sweeping if you want to bring home that gold. You've heard don't drink the Kool-Aid, how about don't eat the stew? Pozole is a traditional stew that includes pork, garlic, and corn product known as hamai. Look at that, don't you want to lick the screen? The modern name is a variation of the original name, the spoken language of the Mexica and their descendants today. The Mexica themselves would have eaten what they called I can't pronounce it, but it's the same dish. The most important staple was corn, a crop that was so important to Aztec society that it played a central part in their religious beliefs. You guys knew that this was gonna come up eventually, but I'm actually gonna be saving that sacrifice-y stuff for the next point to address the specific cultural practice of this one. This is the one night you might wanna break out I don't feel hungry excuse as a kid, especially if you saw dad coming home with a captive from his recent battle. Once said captive is dealt with, a portion would be delivered to the Mexica who had captured that sacrifice. The Stu was pre-prepared since dad had time to get home and be like, hey babe, guess what, take out tonight, beforehand, and then when that portion was delivered to the household, well someone would be put in the stew and served. The capture himself was forbidden to eat it, however, his family would. So dad's just sitting there awkwardly at the head of the table watching everyone eat what's metaphorically the fish he just caught. The one you've definitely been waiting for, protein deficiency. Summer of 1521, Cortez has once again has his handed to him by the Mexica and had to flee. From the lake shore his men watch as 62 companions are hauled up to the shrine platform for all to see. Here they are made to dance with a form of fan in front of the Mexica idols before being laid down and sacrificed. They're still beating hearts lifted from their chests. Bernal Diaz recounts that story. Cortez alongside him and a few others lived to be the only Europeans to see human sacrifice by the Mexicas. The Spaniards successfully invaded and destroyed the empire in the nature of greed shortly after. We know for a fact their religion demanded more human sacrifices than any any other faith in history, a minimum of five to eight hundred each year in order to appease the gods. But anthropologist Michael Harner also proposes the theory that the growing population's effect on fauna could have contributed to the decision. Maybe some sacrifice weren't because the gods asked, but because people were starving and others volunteered themselves for the cause. Mexica were sacrificed just as much as their captured enemies were. After all, if you remember from point two, you get a pretty decent afterlife. So their integrity solved farming and land resource issues, but it can't conjure up protein. Whatever the reason is, this is the route the Mexica took, and it's been largely ignored and covered up in historical information, whether consciously or unconsciously, until more recent years. It's likely due to embarrassment for nationalistic reasons, but also out of a desire to portray indigenous peoples in the best light possible when we already face so much bigotry and assumptions as is. Ironically, both these attitudes represent European ethnocentralism regarding man-eating behavior, a viewpoint to be expected from a culture that's always relatively been abundant for livestock, meat, and milk. Always. In the in the end, the Spaniards' whole excuse occurring the Mexica has always been the basis of preventing human sacrifice, but in reality it was a series of unprovoked attacks on the Mexica leading up to the mass purely because of the gold they had. They didn't know about the sacrifices till later. So ask yourself, why is the Mexica seen as so evil for sacrificing then? Killing or dying for religion isn't even close to abnormal. Look at the Crusades and the Holy Wars, really any slaying in the name of the Bible and other religious texts, and how we manage to rationalize it. Why does history do so for colonialists who oversaw the erasure of these indigenous peoples worldwide in the name of religion and greed? and dub them as men of their time, yet condemn the Mexica for doing way less than what they did. It's the same words, different font.
New circus, same monkeys. You get the picture. But we're gonna start by correcting another incorrect assumption. They were actually defeated by disease, not the Spaniards. Come on guys, you gotta give them more credit than that. I mean, Cortez tried to invade them an easy three times and just kept failing and failing. The only reason their invasion of the Mexica ever succeeded was the other indigenous clans in the area were so sick of them, they joined the Spaniards to wipe them out. And the Spaniards contributed so little to that battle, they only lost about 100 soldiers. So even if they had defeated the Mexica by battle, it wasn't even them who got to say that they really did. Meanwhile, 200 plus thousand indigenous people, Mexica or otherwise, perished that day. In reality, Mexica actually had a strong chance of beating the Spanish, if not for the smallpox they contracted from the Europeans that wiped out a mass majority of their populace, especially their leaders. It's extremely unlikely they would have ever fallen. The amount of harm caused by European diseases on a worldwide scale was tremendous. Shout out to not showering and being scared of hygiene, you nasty MFs. It's estimated that over 20 million Mexicas died in just a period of five years alone. Worst part is, it's not even like they were going to a heavenly place after death. Mexica believed in a nightmarish afterlife. Well, for some, let me explain. While most afterlives are froofy My Little Pony crap that rewards you unconditionally, the Mexica believed how you died determined what afterlife you received. And there were four categories you could fall into. The warrior's afterlife showed exactly how much the Mexica loved war. If someone died in battle or was sacrificed to the gods, their souls would go to the west afterlife, which involved more war, helping one of their gods fight against darkness to ensure the sun would always rise. The afterlife of the east was for the other type of warriors, women who passed carrying a child or during the birth of it. They were treating it similarly to fallen soldiers and sacrifices, and they helped prepare the sun for its journey into the underworld. In the south was an afterlife for people who die because they are struck by lightning, drowned, or died from some kind of sickness. In that afterlife, there was plenty of food and comfort. Finally, the north, called Michelin. It was for people who died ordinary deaths from like old age, and in the afterlife, their souls had four years to pass through eight levels of challenges. The ninth level was where their soul finally found rest. So yeah, wild stuff, but remember it for context in some of the later segments. Number eight is how alcohol survived as a drugstore prescription. One exception to the ban on distributing alcohol was that drugstores were allowed to sell medicinal whiskey to treat everything from headaches to the flu. By the way, what was more messed up here is that the fact that alcohol was being prescribed and how some doctor's orders were things like take three ounces every hour until stimulated. With the physician's prescription, you could obviously pick up a pint of hard liquor and it was every 10 days that you were allowed to do so. Obviously, if you found a prohibition hating pharmacist or doctor, it would be easy to schmooze or bribe or even just ask for an alcohol prescription and just be given one. Also, it's hard not to see profit. So many pharmacists and doctors started their own secret speakeasies and then also many prohibitionists also operated under the guise of being these pharmacists and doctors to have these speakeasies as well. According to the prohibition historian Daniel Orkent, windfalls from illegal alcohol sales helped the drugstore chain Walgreens grow from 20 locations to more than 500 during the 1920s and into what it is today. Number seven's messed up fact is drunken husbands are literally the reason why women were the ones at the forefront of the prohibition movement. The anti-alcohol sentiment was on such a great scale with women as in the times after the Civil War, they had just seen the returns of their beloved husbands alive. But they were always going to the saloons, which were particularly booming spots at the time. In short, many wives saw liquor as a home wrecker and were pissed that their husbands were coming home sloshed every day. Unfortunately, the drinking levels did lead to more reports of domestic discourse as well as poverty. Since so many women pushed for prohibition, it actually helped lead to women's suffrage as male prohibition supporters and government realized if women could vote, they'd increase the votes in favor of prohibition to unforeseen levels and make the bill pass. So remember, if we did it once, we can do it again. Don't don't play with us. Fear mongering is number six, as misinformation and odd beliefs really did mess up the public perception of alcohol. Some unbelievable claims of the time were that alcohol would turn your blood into water, like a reverse internal Jesus situation, or that wine was made from crushed cockroaches. Another fun one is your brain would catch on fire from drinking, and seeing as hangovers existed, people used those as their proof. Secondhand smoke? Oh, what about secondhand alcohol in the room? Apparently, the sight of alcohol could affect adults and and children so it must be hidden. What if you went blind from seeing it? Apparently your liver could grow 25 pounds from a beer a day, and if that didn't happen, then edema would get you. Prohibition era enforcers really came up with a slew of 
untrue, unrealistic claims. This did cause an issue post prohibition, as the fear mongering was dismissed and people simply waved away the idea that alcohol could be bad for you for quite a long time. This obviously increased addiction as well as diseases perpetuated by alcohol consumption. Oops. For number five, people converted to drink. Another loophole in prohibition law is that wine could still be consumed for religious purposes, something done in both Judaism and in the Catholic Christian religions. When prohibition hit, conversion and enrollment in churches and synagogues soared. It is significantly easier to convert to Catholicism or Christianity than it is to Judaism, so those were the first two choices of the three. Many men preferred to avoid the circumcision that was required of them even in adulthood. Cities also saw a huge surge of self-proclaimed rabbis and priests who obtained their wine for congregations. When investigated, sometimes these congregations didn't actually exist. Similar to the pharmaceutical and doctoral industry, even a religious man could enjoy a little bit of a drink and find ways to ensure those around him could enjoy it too. Number 4, we see the birth of NASCAR. Okay, I know it's not necessarily messed up, but there is no way I could learn this and not tell you. Bootlegger cars were stripped, framed, modded to the nines, and armored up. This is actually the same thing you'll see today with how NASCAR vehicles need to be stock, having traditional car bodies instead of those you see in the Formula Ones or the Indy cars. Bootlegger cars also had a false gas tank, removed back and passenger seats, and a modded engine and faux floorboards that aided in the $3 billion smuggle industry, when they weren't racing each other of course. The act of racing wasn't only for fun, as it prepared drivers for police evasion using unique tricks and confidence in their ability to speed away safely without losing any precious cargo. A representative of the Mob Museum stated that many future NASCAR drivers cut their teeth bootlegging illegal moonshine in the 1940s, such as NASCAR Hall of Famer Junior Johnson, who won his learner's permit by running Corn Mash Hooch before his NASCAR debut in 1955. Before and even after Prohibition came to an end, racing these high performance cars became a popular pastime amongst runners in North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, and elsewhere in the South. They raced each other's cars, many of them Ford models, on weekend afternoons out in the country on makeshift dirt tracks, what would evolve into the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, or NASCAR in 1947. Number three was waiting to watch the economy boom. Instead, it slumped. Fantastically. Let's learn about it. It was expected in the dawn of the dry era that casual consumption would thrive. Clothing and household item sales would skyrocket, and leisure activities like artistic dance and theater productions would be selling out as people sought new forms of entertainment. Manufacturers were excited too, thinking that chewing gum, grape juice, and soda, all alcohol supplements, were going to be in the highest of demand. And with saloons closed, neighborhoods should be able to clean up, and new store spaces will be available, and that means a raise in rent, right? At this point, crime could even potentially disappear and clean, respected civilians take its place. So it makes sense for towns across the US to sell their jailhouses, right? Yeah. Man, they thought alcohol would change all that? Wrong! All across the board. Restaurants closed, having lost liquor profit, and theater revenue declined. Then came unemployment. Brewery, distillery, and saloon workers were out of work, but so were the barrel makers, the truckers, the waitresses, any trade relating to liquor. Instead of new stores opening up, everything was closing down, and now unemployment and poverty was on the rise. The rate of crime skyrocketed. Good job selling your prisons because now you have criminals rising to the level of infamy still reputable in modern day. In whole, the economy was messed up big time from the government's decision, as was their social structure. This is something that took years to undo, even when alcohol was reintroduced into the public domain. Number two, we see invading the space. What do I mean? Well, segregation was a law during the Prohibition era, but that was also when American jazz was starting to boom with young white Americans. Despite the segregation many of their parents encouraged and supported, young white people start to venture into black communities of cities like New York and Chicago to indulge in their speakeasies and their jazz bars. Now this is a majorly dicey violation of a community's safe space during a time when they needed to cultivate it, as they only had each other and faced discrimination from those outside of it. But white voyeurism brought economy into it. Dance crazes of the 1920s such as the Charleston Foxtrot and Lindy Hop were popularized by mostly the white crowd bopping along to the jazz music. This was great for the black musicians and pro prohibitioners alike, so came the begrudging creation of black and tan clubs, exclusively found in black communities. However, the interaction in these desegregated clubs were
are usually stylized, a watered down, romanticized, and stereotyped version of black life that was more palatable for the new flow of white consumerism. As a result, black and tan clubs were more symbolic than any real socialization or actual mixing. Some clubs allowed anyone to enter, but then they would stretch a rope across the dance floor and bars so that white and black dancers wouldn't mix or use the same bar sides. Many clubs would cater to black clientele during the day and then switch to only white people at night with black musicians only being present. Sometimes they were purely white clientele with black staff no matter the hour. So while white socialites who felt themselves to be progressive pleasure seekers infiltrated these clubs under the guise of cultural appreciation, it left black artists, staff, and customers of the time to stay wary in the communities they should feel safe in. For number one, we hear about government poisoning. As you heard from one of our previous points, the government really boofed this whole thing and got pretty much every assumption wrong. So like petty children, they kind of lashed out in the worst way possible. In their effort to minimize illegal consumption, the US government believed that by poisoning illegal alcohol, people would be discouraged from drinking it. The poisoning was done by processing the illegal hooch through filtration so they became industrialized alcohols, which means it's undrinkable and used for things like medical or mechanical. A good example is hydrogen peroxide, and I encourage you not to look up what happens when you drink that. Instead of discouraging people, in 1926 there were reported 400 plus deaths as a result of this government initiative, and a year later in 1927, 700 reported deaths. Originally smugglers found tricks around this, and they managed to filter the alcohol to be resold again. Unfortunately, the government simply used different techniques to ensure the poison stuck, knowing full well what would happen when it reached the consumers. Number 10 is it wasn't illegal to drink. Now that can be confusing since as you probably already know, the purpose of banning alcohol was so that nobody drank alcohol. However, you'll learn today there was a lot of loopholes around it. For example, the 18th Amendment forbade the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors. So by law, if you already had them in your home in 1920 when the law dropped, well it was yours to keep and enjoy in the privacy of your own home. Most people only had a couple bottles, some had whole wine cellars, or some ran to the grocery stores to clear out the entire stock so they could have an illegal, legal stockpile at home. Number 9 is another loophole, how to hide the booze. Like teens at Coachella, the people of the 1920s wanted to sneak their alcohol around. So how did they do it? Well, some larger examples are faux books that were actually a flask, easy to bring to class or to your weekend visit at your mom's. Lamps and globes were also popularly converted into alcohol stash spots. Want something more portable for a movie theater or a park stroll? Well how about a hollowed out cane or umbrella? Women even wore garters at the time, so they made tiny little flasks to fit in those as well. They're really cute. These tricks get more strange and messed up. One unhurried smuggler is documented being caught by US custom agents after he dropped a basket of eggs. The agents discovered that the smuggler had carefully poked holes in all of the eggs, drained them, filled them with alcohol, sealed them back up. There's even an example of a tailor using a tailor's dummy that was literally 12 pints of bottles sewed up by the tailor in the shape of its body. Next up is the world's worst group project. Religion is a weapon sharper than any blade and has brought more blood than anyone ever could. What started as an archaic way for us to explain our existence has turned into an excuse to commit any atrocity in the name of someone who may not even be there at all. That's what faith is, isn't it? No absolution or surety, God's there protecting you, blessing you, seeing you, rather simply having faith and belief that they are. When humans decide to have surety our gods were real and lost the whole point of faith, we began to truly use religion and the ideology of gods as a reason for war. Not all groups, however. Mongols were a great example, a religiously and ethnically diverse army they were just cool with about anything as long as you don't get in the way of the empire. Some Mongols, both individually and in groups, adopted Christian practices, though it's not clear how much of the European political leaders knew about this. But they knew about Khan, at least in a Eurocentric interpretation of him, and that he could be a powerful ally to help knock down the Muslim powers that be, perhaps even open the way for a new Christian Jerusalem again. Early 13th century, it must have been clear that the Christian crusaders were steadily losing ground, thus they began to reach out to Genghis Khan, supposedly having sent written letters to the notorious leader who could easily be their key in religious persecution. Still, even the political tidal wave of the Mongol Empire wasn't bound to go on forever, and neither were the Muslim-led forces helpless. It all more or less came crashing down in 1260 when Mamluk Sultanate held back the Mongols in Palestine. The descendants of Genghis Khan could and would go no further, halting any bare hope of a Mongo-European alliance. Hey, another fun fact about the Christian Crusaders to tie into that, they peaked like high schoolers. 
rulers. So the first crusades of the 11th century were the most successful, at least from the European Christian perspective. Crusaders had captured the holy city of Jerusalem for Christ's sake, and that's like 80% of what this whole war is about. But it's also hard to stop something as simultaneously impassioned and nebulous as a holy war once it gets rolling. Surely, some must have also questioned the human cost of all that war, with the many lives and combatants and innocent like snuffed out in the name of raising a right sort of flag over Jerusalem and other cities. Even throne emperors and kings. Example, while traveling 12th century Turkey in the Third Crusade, 67 year old Emperor Frederick Barbosa is said to have drowned. Some of his heartbroken followers attempted to preserve his body in vinegar for the trip back. Didn't work and they pickled him? Called that pickled di Anyways, there were many crusades after that first one to tune out about eight different extended campaigns in addition to various battles and other ill-considered ventures like the stupid children's crusades you've heard about in some of our videos. Ultimately, as Muslim forces like those of the Sarakens and the Mamluks took back more and more of the region, it became clear that the first crusade was just the high point for Europeans. One thing they did that some of us still do is listen to the big sky rocks. Throughout history, astronomical phenomena like Comets, meteors, and other heavenly objects moving in the sky have been interpreted as omens and portents. We forget that we have all the explanation we have now for what's going on up there, but they didn't. Dude, if the sun rose an hour later than usual, everyone thought it was Armageddon. Imagine that mindset, the level of terror and anxiety. Take the comet of 1517, which was witnessed over the land of the Aztec Mexica ruler Montezuma II and inspired a sense of foreboding ahead of the looming Spanish conquest. Things weren't much different elsewhere for the Christians and the Muslims of the Crusades, astronomical phenomena was always interpreted as good or bad omens, and most were unwilling to accept the signs in the sky as scientific phenomena only, even when empires like the Ottomans began to delve into astronomy. This is an example of how religion could mow down the paganism that was there before, but it was never truly lost in our conscious. Per Lumen Learning, the 11th century members of the People's Crusade seemed especially primed to interpret meteors and comets as favorable omens. Some even went as far as to link sights in the sky with the end of the world, which could have been a tactic deployed by the church to keep everyone in line, as the church kinda likes to do. It certainly got tied into the first crusade when a meteor shower was spotted on April 3rd of 1095, and that pushed Pope Urban II to declare a holy war. Could have just been part of a motivation to score as many religious points for himself as possible before the apocalypse came though. During the crusades, one guy accepted a side quest fight a bear. That absolute legend was Godfrey of Bouillon who started the royal line of Jerusalem off with a bang evidently. So naturally, given that he lived in the 11th century and the way that medieval chroniclers like to play fast and loose with truth on occasion, it's no wonder that the real man is tied up in some wild stories. And we really do mean wild, like banging biddies, drugs, and rock and roll. Godfrey was a noble knight crusader and flighty intercourse fiend and overall chill dude. He was out twiddling his thumbs on his horse, enjoying the weather, when he comes across some poor Poor sad sap who was just trying to collect sticks get mauled by a bear. Godfrey, sword at the ready, galloped in to help, but gets straight up yeeted from his own horse by the bear. He is at a hardcore disadvantage for a while, but all his tin man armor and strength worked in his favor and some help from another knight passing by as well. With his own history of mud wrestling, Godfrey beat Winnie the Pooh off himself. Naturally he was roughed up something awful, but homeboy lived and had two witnesses to the account and the tale was recorded by Albert of Atkins. Regardless, while some may be skeptical as to whether or not Godfrey actually went mano a mano with a bear. We do know he went on to rule Jerusalem for a single year, and his younger brother Baldwin later became the first king of Jerusalem. For some reason, during the Crusades, the Europeans made up an imaginary rich BFF. The Christian Crusade was desperate, wimpy lot since day one. They wanted a powerful foreign ally so bad, but every foreign would look at their crusade and their religion, suck their teeth, and go, I appreciate the offer, but the Crusades' desire for a powerful foreign ally was so strong, people just collectively invented one instead, like a super powered imaginary friend on a geopolitical scale. Prester John, a rumored king who was not only incredibly rich and influential, but definitely wanted to help only the Christian cause. The basics of the myth is Prester John was both a physical king and a Christian holy man, like a pope or an archbishop. His faraway lands, variously described as being in somewhere like Ethiopia or Japan, were full of wonders and riches, including vast gold deposits and a fountain of youth. Rumors of things they'd heard of greater empires having and that's where everyone knew the greater empires were. If only history would remember it that way, but erasure. Some writings even claim that his kingdom had a garden of paradise, the original earth of which Adam and Eve were evicted from long ago. And if he could only make contact with the crusaders, he would totally help them and take them back to the holy land in a heartbeat. But oh, damn, he's just like he can't right now, he's on vacation. 
you know. Only no one ever found Presser John. Sure, there were plenty of letters and chronicles daring to outline his kingdom and way of life, but no one was able to say that he'd actually met the ruler. And as the centuries rolled on and Europeans began to visit Africa and Asia, it soon became clear Presser John was either very good at hiding or had never existed. Like Jack and the Beanstalk, these morons actually had a holy goose. It's safe to say that the most medieval Europeans who went on the crusade to the Holy Land and did so at the urging of a powerful, sometimes even charismatic individual. Now whether that's a god or some lunatic king or a combo of a lunatic king saying he's a god, which is probably just the voice of the half developed twin's brain sharing his skull caused by all the in family relations. As religious intensity of the crusades built, more and more people felt it was their Christian duty to free the region or at least gawk at the fighting and maybe take part in some adventuring and plundering opportunities. Historic erasure, but make it fun. The growing tide of interested folks combined with the church making everyone feel special eventually produced some pretty weird leaders, like a goose. In 1096, People's Crusade was an unofficial one that wasn't technically sanctioned by the Pope, and that's what made a crusade a crusade, by the way. Yet plenty of regular folks took part, and even some following a holy goose. In one version of the tale, a poor woman is trailed by one of her geese, and through a series of misinterpretations and misunderstandings, people began to believe that this was a divinely inspired goose leading them. Chroniclers jumped on the chance to make these guys look like historical idiots, and they were, but so was everyone of the crusade, so jokes on you chroniclers, y'all are in the club too. Seriously, who tries to follow a goose to Jerusalem anyways? Especially since by most medieval understandings, animals didn't have a soul, so they couldn't understand the divine to begin with. How are you guys gonna follow it all the way there, give them a tip, and then say move along, you aren't allowed in? That's unfair. Now for the poor people of Christ who ate the other poor people, not of Christ, or sometimes of Christ, they didn't really care. Usually once that type of behavior starts up, either God is super involved, like the Mexica Aztecs, or it is super not. As mentioned, there is ton of crusades you could go on back then. It, the purpose of crusades began to splinter over time, and quite a few people went for religious reasons, sure, perhaps wanting to wash away their sins in one great grand gesture. Others, it seems, were more in it to exercise their xenophobia and the possible financial gain from plundering foreign lands. And for many, those motivations got all mixed up and produced some very strange situations. Like how the Tafers were a group of crusaders who took strict vows of poverty to the point where they wore rough clothing, discarded all of their weapons, which were mostly rusty farm tools, and ate grass and roots to survive. The Tafers also had a reputation for ruthless war making and plundering, to the point where over time they creeped out even other crusaders. Like they could often be relied on to throw themselves wholeheartedly into battle, but they also devastate innocent people and settlements that they come across. Chroniclers often called the Tafers depraved, and depraved is the best word for what they became notorious for doing. The reported acts of people eating during the siege of Antioch, where the chroniclers maintained that they were among the first to consume fallen comrades and enemies alike, and the only ones to do so without hesitation. One chronicler wrote that another siege produced hunger so terribly that the crusaders were tormented by madness of starvation, and so resorted to consuming the remains of enemies that they had thrown into the swamp weeks before. That must have been the most effed up fishing trip imaginable. Soon enough, the creepy reputation of these particular crusaders began to spread beyond the walls of Antioch when the Muslim commanders asked the Christian crusade commanders to reign in the Tafers because obviously this crap is out of hand, super creepy, and it's not even about religion anymore. Yeah, no, the Christian crusaders leaders had to awkwardly admit they couldn't actually control the Tafers, and it was surely an unnerving realization to finally admit that some of the most fanatical elements under their supposed command were so wild and intense they weren't really under anyone's power but their own. Muslim commanders really could only give a metaphorical deadpan, seriously guys, expression when they heard that one. And last but not least, it's weaponized bees. Finding this has been one of like the single most euphoric things I've ever experienced, just a 10 out of 10 for comedy and serotonin. So get this, King Richard is recording of having used hives of bees as a catapult launched bombs against the Saracens during the third crusade in the 12th century. Naturally, I wanted to find out more about this, so I google it and I find a web page that's literally dedicated to bee warfare in ancient history. Guys, there is tons, tons, it's a complete rabbit hole. I've pretty much shown it to everyone I know, and it was like news on par with like royal weddings or whatever big stuff there is. Anyways, amongst all the centuries of bee warfare there's been, no joke, during the crusades there was only one documented case, written in a poem, that King Richard had 13 ships laid with hives of bees, which he later used to defeat Muslim forces during the siege of Acre, a city that's now modern Israel. Apparently he deployed those many hives and their buzzing occupants to such a great effect that the Sacrocenes holding the city 
retreated. AKA, they loaded the B words, pun intended, into an effing catapult and rained down honey laden horror and death. Don't want to sign a peace treaty? Bees. Want to battle? Have a bees instead. You got a king, we got a queen, bee. That one was Taylor. Sure, there's a good chance that this is all BS history. It's worth noting that the poem was written about two centuries after the events described supposedly happened, but. As I said, there are thousands of cases where bees were used as weapons in battle all over the world and through history and more than once in Jerusalem. So I'm team B on this one. All the bee movie jokes. First up is how land scurvy was a literal thing. Which I know evokes more like a piratey imagery, turning into scurvy knaves from all the liquor, no sunny D, but that's the hang up. You see severe vitamin C deficiency, which causes scurvy, has no borders. Ain't no mountain high enough, valley low enough, river wide enough type of energy baby. And no, it's not an easy fix. It's not, oh, just eat some oranges, my guy, here's some five alive. You and your fancy people knowledge of citrus. You gotta remember these guys ate like medieval folks. So, as author Andrew Holt explains, crusaders greatly emphasized meat consumption only. And medieval knights generally equated meat eating with strength. Still no dudes with that ideology, have fun with that bulk loss bro, but how bad did land scurvy get? Well, it killed one sixth of the French army during the fifth crusade. Written descriptions detail the agony of these crusaders, such as the 12 siege, when men seized with violent pain in the feet and ankles, their gums became swollen and their teeth loose and useless, while their hips and shin bones turned black and putrefied. The peaceful death that followed sounded more like a mercy than loss. Scurvy proved overwhelming during the seventh crusade as well, reducing the troops of Louis the Sixth to bouts of pained howling as barbers sliced large pieces of flesh from the men's swollen gums. Next one lets me break out just a terrible godfather impression. Ready? Ready? Today, on the day of my Thought is what I shouldn't have done it. Saladin, one of the most famous but most complicated figures of the crusading eras. A Kurdish leader, he was born around 1137 AD and was the first sultan of Syria and Egypt fighting against the Christian Crusades. A skilled negotiator, manipulator, and brilliant mind, he was known for cruelty but he could also be a noble and logical dude and occasionally merciful and compassionate, as shown in the Surge of Karak in 1183. While besieging the crusader stronghold of Karak, 1183, Saladin reportedly ordered his army to avoid striking a particular area of the castle, because that is where future queen Sibiela's younger half-sister Isabella was supposed to be having her wedding that night with her new husband. See, crusade queen Sibiela was famously married not to a European nobleman or a descendant of kings, but a landless, virtually unknown nincompoop guy, Le Suigion, out of love, after a whole lot of public rejections and emotional BS and widowhood. But as hardcore as that story is, which trust me, it is, I'm telling the one of her sister's equally wild wedding. So, as Saladin and his armies approach Karak Castle, Baldwin III, big bro of the bride and of Sibiella, say, let's take a quick walk, bro, and reach to deal with Saladin. One sister had already been through enough, let's keep this peaceful, you know, day of my sister's wedding, whatever. The attack on the castle could continue as long as the chamber where the wedding was taking place would just be unharmed. Saladin actually agreed to this and respectfully only laid siege to every other area of the castle. Number eight, Napoleon Complex. All right, this next one here goes out to all the short kings. Turns out height is just the number. And depending which time period you're looking at, well, you were tall. Maybe, probably. Napoleon Bonaparte, famously known as the Little Corporal, was five feet, two inches tall. But this was in pre-French Revolution units. Today, buddy, that's five foot six inches in US measurements. So we're good. The average male height in France at the time was five foot Five. There we go. Napoleon complex is to refer to small men with inferiority problems and all that jazz. So maybe it's time to shelf that. Maybe we gotta stop saying that. We gotta change it to ET the extraterrestrial complex. He was a short lad, no? A little wee guy. Number seven, Spanish flu, AKA the three day flu, otherwise and more famously known as the Spanish influenza. This killed around 50 million people back in 1918. To put in perspective, that's 34 million more than every casualty from World War I. Yeah, it wasn't playing around. We can confidently say now, today the plagues don't f around. Spain was hit early with the disease. Spain's king got it, everyone got it. So of course, we've been trying to pinpoint where this disease kicked off. But John Barry, historian and author of The Great Influenza, suggests that based on all the evidence available, the Spanish flu originated in Haskell County, Kansas. Yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore, the Spanish flu. Number six, 
Iron Maiden. Yeah, believe it or not, the band Iron Maiden, completely made up. No, I'm just kidding. When we look back at punishments in the 15th century, the Iron Maiden was not one of them. I mean, it certainly looks the part, the enclosed iron case, spikes. Sure, it's a neat concept, but the Iron Maiden was first invented in the 18th century when they were pieced together from artifacts in a museum. Otherwise, no, no people were forced into an Iron Maiden ever. That wasn't a casual punishment, know what I mean? You don't pay your taxes, you don't get to walk into an Iron Maiden. But in 1515, a coin forger was sentenced to die in a casket that had metal spikes driven into it, into the, you know, worst parts of your body. And in a 5th century book called The City of God, St. Augustine wrote about a device that sounds quite similar. Quote, They shut him up in a narrow box in which he was compelled to stand, and in which finely sharpened nails were fixed all around him, so that he could not lean upon any part of it without intense pain. And so they killed him by depriving him of sleep. So, yeah, sounds mighty uncomfortable, dare I say a little... Similar, but wasn't common, thank God. Number five, 300. While it's one thing to love Gerard Butler and his drawn on abs, the story of the 300 Spartans fighting against the 10,000 Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae may not be as accurate as you think. It was still pretty intense, it's just, you know, Different. August 480 BC. The Greek city Sparta was celebrating a week-long holiday, Carnea, as a tribute to Apollo Carneos, aka the god of flocks and herds. Pretty important time. As part of this homage, the worshippers here are forbidden to participate in a war of any kind. So King Leonidas of Sparta was only able to rally up his personal guard at the time, and that this area, of 300 soldiers to bring with him, as well as about 4,000 other soldiers from other different city-states, in which the Snyder Cut seemed to have left out. Yeah, they didn't make the final cut, those 4,000 extras. They did defend themselves for days of battle, that is all true, and they did get betrayed by a countryman who led the Persian king down a back road through the mountains, okay? That all happened, and they did have a last stand where everybody met their fate, only it was 1,500 people, not 300. Number four burned. Back in 1692, the town of Salem, Massachusetts, we've all heard about these women before, especially on this channel. Betty Paris and Abigail Williams, they were the first two witches, witches, of Salem. They started behaving a bit odd one day, and then they were described as screaming or throwing things around, yelling, throwing a tantrum, speaking in tongues, and contorting themselves into odd positions. Yeah, I imagine that was quite haunting to see. So eventually, it started to spread, this hysteria also started to spread, and eventually 25 people were put to death after being accused of being witches. 19 died from hanging, 5 met their demise while in jail serving time, and Giles Corey, you've heard about him before, he was pressed to death with stones. But none of them were actually burned at the stake. It was just classic rye bread poisoning. It was just making making everyone else confused at the time. There was no fire and stakes. That's no. It was all awful and, you know, uneducated. Definitely, but no, we weren't burning people. Not yet, at least. Number three, King Tut's curse. We talk about curses quite a bit here on Bumblebee, so let's put one to bed, shall we? Let's just tuck one of these curses in the back of our minds. 1332 BC, King Tut was the last of his royal family to rule, and for ages now, the pharaoh's treasures, politics, social status, you name it, have all remained a mystery, more or less. Until recent days, it would actually be extremely hard to get a glimpse at some of the ancient belongings once owned by one King Tut. But a newly opened museum allows you to get up close and personal to all of these belongings. It's beautiful. But some visitors are hesitant. Some want to stay as far away from said belongings because they still believe in King Tut's curse. Do you remember this? Maybe your parents heard about this. Back in 1923, a British archaeological team opened the tomb of King Tut for the first time. George Herbert was an earl from England and he died shortly after this expedition. He helped out Howard Carter's team. So newspapers marked this death as a curse of the pharaohs, just because they could. No, the earl actually passed away from pneumonia and poor health from the previous two decades. But newspapers are like, hey, check this out. You don't want to touch that now, do you? Number two. Cleopatra. Let's keep the theme in Egypt for a little bit, shall we? Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. No siree. She just loved them. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty rather, of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. Now, DNA-wise, she wasn't Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn Egyptian, unlike her family, who refused to learn anything up until that point. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. So that's why we often confuse her for thinking that she's Egyptian. This is where we, you know, 
more than fair. She definitely looked the part. And finally, number one, Vomitorium. This one's fun to believe, and I've made some fun about it in history, but you know what? We've got to correct some things now, don't we? I'm sure there's cases where this room did exist at a certain time, but the Vomitorium was not as fun as we think. No. We've got to end this list off on a gross note. Let's do it. Ancient Romans. We've heard about how they would help themselves on fine food until the point of, you know, no more. Vomitorium comes from Latin. Vomo means to spew out or to discharge. So a room where one would do that, obviously you can imagine. Oh, it's pretty gross, right? But it also meant a passageway behind seats at a stadium where people could quickly move to different areas of the building. Yeah, it's got the two meanings, rather just the one, but it sounds like, you know, the other. It could be a place to sneak off to and then throw up, but really it's just a back exit. They're like, please don't throw up back here. We don't, we don't want that. It sounds like it, but it's not. It's not. Starting with his entrusted and encrusted crap man. In Henry's court, his servants vied to be as physically close to the king as possible at all times. In case you aren't aware, especially towards the end of his reign, Henry was a tad bit of a lunatic. The more he liked you, the less likely you were to die for looking at him funny on a bad day of his. But naturally, the monarch reserved the honor of being close to his royal person only for a trusted few people, the grooms of the stools. No, not his counselor, personal butler, none of his advisors the guy that wiped his ass. And during his reign, only four men got the gig of groom of the stool, the most physically intimate position and therefore the most honored of his attendants. These grooms not only helped dress and undress the king before and after the bathroom and, you know, handled the poop brush for him, but in an insane twist, they also controlled public and personal access to the monarch and some of his finances. They even had power over a stamp of the king's signature, which is a major financial tool. Imagine being one of his wives and having to ask the guy who wipes your husband's if you can talk to him, and he says no. But if he could afford that kind of luxury employee, why was he called the Copper-Nosed King? Easy, while Henry's kingdom amassed a great wealth and property during the English Reformation by confiscating Catholic monasteries, Henry then turned around and drove England into debt with his overspending and lavish lifestyle. Dude was a complete eclectic, and he wanted to buy everything shiny and pretty he saw, so he did. It's reported by the time he dropped, Henry owned approximately 50 palaces, 6,500 plus weapons, 70 ships, 78 recorders, 78 flutes, 5 sets of bagpipes, and a virginal. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's a type of harpsichord. Not to mention the millions of dollars he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. So it's pretty obvious he was burning through the kingdom's funds, and by the end of his reign, Henry had it down to the pocket change. Quite literally. He was forced to lower the percentage of silver in the British coinage to the point that they were mostly copper with the silver coating that wore away from the coins embossed image of Henry's face, starting with the nose. Thus, Copper knows. When Henry's son Edward took the throne, the royal coffers were in a real bad state. Number eight, Abraham Lincoln the wrestler. Abraham Lincoln was a vampire hunter in that one movie, but in real life, he was also a wrestler. Yeah, he was kind of a bad who knew? Abe Lincoln was a famous American statesman and politician who of course served as the 16th president of the United States from 1861 until he was killed in 1865. Now, as a young man, before he changed history of course, as a young man, Lincoln was known for his impressive physical strength and was said to have been an accomplished wrestler. Yeah, if he had seen that attack coming, he probably would have knocked them right out. I don't know. Dude's choking out politicians. Like what? According to some accounts, he participated in several wrestling matches in his youth, including one in which he was defeated by a man named Jack Armstrong. Yeah, imagine tapping out Abe Lincoln. How dare you, Jack? What are you doing? Lincoln was also a big fan of wrestling and often attended matches just to watch, even though he wasn't, you know, getting in tights and brawling with people. In fact, it's said that once he walked 20 miles just to watch a wrestling match where his favorite wrestler, Cornelius the Cornishman Grogan, was competing. So, yeah, he was committed to the bits, you know? He was committed to the craft, I guess. His involvement in the sport helped to cement its popularity in the United States. You know, of course, being a president who wrestled, that's, yeah, fair. That ought to do it. Don't mess with Abe, I guess, or else he'll choke you out or something. Number seven, yellow attire. Back in 1420, the Venetian government issued a law requiring um, ladies of the night to wear yellow attire as a way to easily identify and also regulate their profession. Yeah, and it looks like a big bright banana. Here you go. Look it up, your banana. The law was intended to control the spread of sexually transmitted disease and prevent the moral decay of Venice. So that was their solution. Hey, we're gonna wear yellow tops now. That'll solve everything. 
Nice. These ladies were required to wear a yellow veil and a yellow tunic, but they were also prohibited from wearing any expensive clothing or jewelry. Yeah, no personality, no fun at all, just business. The color yellow was chosen because, well, it was associated with betrayal, envy, and illness. All things sex, I guess. The law remained in effect until the end of the 16th century. My dad has a really bright yellow shirt. I have a new nickname for him now. Can't wait to call him after I'm done filming this one. Called Banana Bill. It's a good one. Number six, no tennis. Yeah, you wanna play doubles? Think again, pal, how dare you? The 1495 tennis law, it was real. It was a French law that prohibited the playing of tennis in public spaces. So if you're gonna do it, do it quietly and privately in your own home, all right? How dare you? Don't, don't even think about playing tennis. Even after this video, don't do it. The law was enacted by King Charles VIII to address concerns about the game being too violent. Yeah, it was supposedly being used to train for combat and the potential for public disorder. Tennis, yeah. Who knew? The law also imposed penalties for those caught violating it, including confiscation of property and imprisonment. Yeah, what are you in for? I was playing doubles with my mother-in-law, so now I'm in prison, I guess. Huh. Yeah, you killed nine people. Nice, can't wait to bunk with you. Despite its intended purpose, the law did not prevent the game from being played, obviously. Can't stop us, pal. It slowly evolved into our modern day tennis, which we love. I love it, it's awesome. Tennis is very intense also. I don't disagree with any of these laws put in place. My father and I got in a bout one time over the lines. Gotta watch those lines. You need a line guy if you're playing tennis. You need it. Number five, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, this was a big deal. I mean, still is, but hear me out. This one reminds me of Stand By Me. What a classic. You can find dead whales, dead bodies. It's the dark ages. You gotta find a lot of things, but you gotta report them, all right? It's the law. You gotta report dead whales, and you gotta report dead people. Both very important. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, well, it varied depending on the region and the time period, of course. But generally, if somebody discovered a dead body, they were required to report it to the courts, or the lords, rather, my lady. So quiet. That's all medieval times right there. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as it was considered suspicious behavior. Which, you know, fair. That's, we'll ask some questions regardless, no matter what. More often than not, the finder would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding this death, including any possible suspects. Yeah, take a guess, detective, no pressure. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body. And in other cases, well, you yourself could be charged with the death of said body. So, I don't know, 50-50, let's do one of these. Oh, I didn't see anything, see ya. Number four, no stealing dead whales. I mentioned it, you wanna know more? Sure, let's do it. I'm not sure how one would do this, first of all, without the help of 490 of their closest friends, because whales are pretty heavy. But the no stealing dead whales law originated in the 17th century in England, where beached whales at the time, they were considered a valuable commodity due to their oil, their meat, their bones, whatever. The law made it illegal at this point to take a beached or stranded whale without permission from authorities or lords and violation of the law could result in fines or imprisonment. Again, imagine going to jail for a whale. Your bunkie has 19 kills. You're like, yeah, I took a whale. So have at her. I can't get a kayak in the water without pulling something. You're telling me people, medieval mobs, hungry mobs drag whales back home. That's impressive, really, if anything. Guys must have been jacked. Nice leg workout. All beached whales in the UK have belonged to the king or the queen since 1324. One guy back in the early 2000s, he actually offered a dead whale to her majesty, but she politely declined. But he was doing it right, you know what I mean? He read some medieval books. He was like, good evening. All right, bring it in. Number three, Abel and Baker. Okay, we often remember Laika, the space dog, and her 103 minute cosmic journey around Sputnik 2. Very short and sweet trip there. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? These two, are you kidding me? This was America's version of Laika. This was less than two years later. On May 28th, 1959, the United States launched two female primates, Abel and Baker, into space. Yeah, we launched monkeys into space. Then we made them snowboard and make movies about skateboarding. But first, we launched them into space, which was crazy. This mission lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home with trauma. Lots of trauma, lots of monkey drama. The monkeys weren't injured from the cosmic commute, but a radio message came in shortly after they splashed down in the Atlantic. And the message said no injuries or rather difficulties. It said Abel, Baker, perfect. Yeah, perfect. I mean, probably not, but they were alive, so. 
perfect enough. I don't think we can blast any more primates into space going 10,000 miles an hour. That's just my guess, but who, you know, this was 1959, things have changed a bit. Abel sadly passed away shortly after the flight. Meanwhile, Baker, Baker got all that fame. She got really famous. She was getting 150 letters a day, like fan mail letters. How is space? What's it like? Were you in movies? Can you skateboard as well like that guy on TV? Imagine if she had Twitter back then. Oh man, these ladies are icons. Never mind Laika. Hit that thumbs up for Abel and subscribe for Baker. Here we go. They're watching right now. They're watching you do it. So you better do it. Number two, the boot. We'll finish with some medieval punishments because, you know, I'm watching Game of Thrones again right now. So why not? Let's do this. The boot was interesting. This was a scary punishment that you won't believe actually happened. We didn't learn about this one back in school. The device at hand here was a massive oversized boot large enough to fit both of your feet. And it was also made of iron or copper. You see where I'm going here. While these boots were often brazed onto the floor, so the accused couldn't move around anywhere. And most of the time they were sitting upright. Now the boots at this point were filled with boiling water or worse, molten lead. And from that point on, well, it's not gonna be great for you, is it? Another medieval punishment involving boots, which is somehow worse in my opinion, was first seen in Ireland. They were lightweight metal boots that were filled with water, individual. Then they heated your feet over a fire until the water inside started to boil out the top of the boot. So I don't know which one's worse, honestly. I'd rather the first one because then it would be faster. You know what I mean? I'm not watching something boil. A watched boot never boils, I guess. Number one, rats. Yeah, save the rats for last. Sure. This one really sums up how terrible humans have been in the past. Rat punishment originated in ancient Rome, classic, but it's been seen many times since, including in Game of Thrones, yeah. What was once called a rat trap involved the accused being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down onto their abdomen or their chest. Now, inside this metal enclosure, there are, of course, rats. One or numerous. I don't know, both suck. Which the strapped down person can feel walking around with their little rat feet. And at this point, the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Now, historically, hot coals were placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for these little scurrying plague rats inside on your chest. I'm getting so hot saying this. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out because, you know, just like us, they have survival instincts. But unlike us, they have really sharp teeth. The sharpest teeth ever. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's chest, that is not. That is fine. You see where this is going now. The rats would eat their way out of the danger and into you, which would cause you a lot of pain. Number 10, pyramid builders. This one has a lot of heat behind it. Online, you'll find one answer or the other. That's really it. It's an ongoing argument to this day. The pyramids of Egypt, as fascinating as they are and as ancient as they are and as colossal as they are, many of us believe that it was actually built by aliens around 4,500 years ago. Yeah, they're so unbelievable that we think, eh, it must have been another species from another planet. No way humans could have done this. A greater number obviously believed that the pyramids were built by slaves. Now this idea started to gain momentum back in 1977 when former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, when they first visited Egypt, they made a statement about how the pyramids were built before the Jewish ever existed. So that causes a new argument. Dieter Wildung, former director of Berlin's Egyptian Museum, spoke out as well, commenting how the world simply cannot believe that the pyramids were built without oppression and without forced labor, but instead out of loyalty to the pharaohs. That's pretty intense. I don't see a world where people would ever do this out of loyalty, but you know what? That was thousands and thousands of years ago, so what do we know? We have different mindsets now, us humans. Number nine, Viking attire. What we often think of Vikings, because, I mean, what else do we think about all day? Sure. We imagine them as brute, bearded, six foot tall, they have an eight pack, they look like Gerard Butler, they're mighty, they look like Thor, right? Now, for film and television, Vikings always have the horned helmet. It's very God of War, right? It's very huh, stoic. It's a great look, don't get me wrong, but it certainly is not historically accurate. Vikings did not have horned helmets, ever. There's no evidence suggesting so. Most Vikings wore leather headgear, but an artist by the name of Gustav Malmundstems from Sweden, he actually painted Vikings with horns back in the 1800s with his work. So the idea didn't come from nowhere, but rather one guy, that painter. But great, lovely piece of work, but you know, we don't need the horns. At number eight, Ancient Wop. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and 
Little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, The one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs and narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no wop, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. Item number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number six, magic attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, sneaky link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the tale of the two brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number four, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now, obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number three, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on Earth, there were same-sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear-cut case of same-sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk, while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. 
Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. Item number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like damn, that's pretty cold dude. And finally at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Number 10, ancient Mayan turkey worship. A lot of words there. Turkeys play a significant role in ancient Mayan culture, both as a source of food and feathers for clothing and decoration. If you were a turkey, you were screwed, really. In any department? Turkeys were domesticated by indigenous peoples in Mexico and Central America. America over 2,000 years ago. And their use and importance grew over time. It, it varies, and sometimes it looks like we're gonna worship a turkey and we have to talk about it. The Mayans also believed in animal symbolism and incorporated it into their religious beliefs. That's why we can sometimes say that they worshiped turkeys. Now, there's no record of turkeys being worshiped as deities, but that's a hot rumor. It's really a fib, but you'll hear that time to time. Turkeys are turkeys, they're not deities, they're just, I don't know, they're yummy, they're delicious, depending on if you like to eat them. Turkeys, yeah, they're deities, the more you know. Number nine, horse priest, Caligula. Let's talk about this fella. He was a Roman emperor who ruled from 37 to 41 CE. Now he was known for his erratic behavior, of course, given what I'm about to say, including his decision to make his horse a priest. His horse a priest. I didn't know it's possible. According to historical accounts, Caligula had a deep attachment to this horse and often lavished it with attention and gifts and lots and lots of pets, I bet. He even went so far as to build a marble stand for Incididus, his horse, and reportedly discussed making him a consul. First of all, a marble stand? Who's gonna. That's insane. Secondly, the decision to make the horse a priest was likely a political move just to mock the Roman Senate, which Caligula was known to despise at the time. So, I don't know. The act was seen as a demonstration of Caligula's power and disregard for traditional Roman customs and or values. Yeah, I would say so. Guy brings a horse in. Imagine being a taxpayer and you see this. Oh, I'd be livid. At least for the men listening. Have fun with that. Number eight is a man of many titles, including Picasso, certified thief. Imagine you have the gall to steal from the Louvre. I'm definitely building up to confirming what you might already be piecing together here, but Pablo Picasso, the sculptor and playwright and painter, was part of an art robbery and even worse, was on the beneficiary end of it. On August 21st of 1911, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is stolen from the Louvre alongside dozens of other art pieces. Eight days later, snitch Joseph Gary Piet revealed to the Paris Journal that Picasso and his friends, avant-garde poet Apollinaire, 
were in possessions of Iberian sculptures that were definitely the ones stolen from the Louvre. And if he had had those, what are the chances he had the Mona? Well, the story continues to unwind and it turns out Piriata himself had stolen the statues and sold them to Picasso, who then bought them despite the stamps on the bottom that read property of the Louvre Museum. This opened up a wide debate if he'd orchestrated this theft instead of just being an innocent artist caught in the middle as Pablo himself painted it to be. Art pun. Picasso turned over the statues to the Paris Journal, but both he and Apollinaire were still questioned in court regarding the whereabouts of the Mona Lisa. However, no evidence could be found that tied them to the theft and they were eventually released. In December 1913, to the relief of Picasso, the Mona Lisa turned up in Florence, Italy. It reveals that a Louvre employee named Venenzio stole it to try and return it to its native Italy. Get ready to gag at number 7, Michelangelo. Why? Cause he reeked. Real bad. And no, not the Ninja Turtle who lived in the sewer and only consumed greasy 7-Eleven pizza because that would make sense. No, 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 no. Real painter Michelangelo refused to bathe. The painter of the Sistine Chapel was one of the lucky artists who actually became famous during his lifetime and stayed that way. However, despite his immense wealth, Michelangelo was pretty lackluster in the hygiene department. On top of his refusal to bathe since he wanted to preserve his natural man musk, this dirty goblin refused to change clothes. Dude, if you're not gonna do one thing, at least do the other. Even Louis XIV, the dude who had a John under his throne and bathed twice in his life, had perfumes made from weekly and at least changed clothes. Michelangelo had no excuse. In fact, on his deathbed, it said his clothing had to be cut and then peeled off of him. I'm moving on. It's just no. Let's talk about the Lord of Dance for number six. Russian ballet dancer Rudolf Nureyev, nicknamed the Lord of the Dance, is often regarded as one of the greatest ballet dancers to have ever lived. Rudolf defected from the Soviet Union to Paris in 1961, and this was the first defection of a Soviet artist during the Cold War. So it created a national sensation. He was the director of the Paris Opera Ballet from 1983 to 89, and its chief choreographer until October of 1992. But thanks to a lovely biography by Dame Beryl Gray, a ballerina who collaborated with Rudolph through the 70s, we know now this guy was a colossal ass. In her book, From the Love of Dance, she describes his black moods, tantrums, and truculent offensive behavior. She recalls one occasion where he was so angry he picked up his thermos flask and hurled it across the room. Another instance was before a performance of Romeo and Juliet in which Rudolph attacked one of our leading ballerinas, Lillian Belliafor, and swore at her, kicked her up the backside so hard she left the stage with great pain. A doctor was called who after examining her said her cock had been damaged and was bent. She was in agony and the doctor advised us that the injury might cause her to act unpredictably and temperamentally. Lillian in a rage reports Rudolph to the police while Gray herself confronted Rudolph in the dressing room. Nerev was not apologetic, she wrote. He began running down the company and saying Bellifor had displeased him. I said, that didn't give you the right to kick her. He answered, I'm the greatest dancer alive. I can do what I want. To which I unguardedly retorted, there are other great dancers too, Rudy. He was furious at this and menacingly picked up a knife but was restrained by his Monsieur Luigi, who upon hearing Ray's voices, someone threw open the door and I was hustled away, with Rudolph shouting, no more performances. He later calmed down, and Lillian was persuaded not to sue him. Back to writers, it's H.P. Lovecraft for number five. One of the most popular writers of all time, Lovecraft has influenced everyone from Stephen King to Neil Gaiman, but while Dr. Seuss definitely made some, offensive cartoons. To put it lightly, he's a veritable social activist compared to H.P. Lovecraft. According to The Atlantic, Lovecraft wrote thousands of letters in his lifetime, and if you ever work up the courage to sift through them, you'll see him praise killings as an ingenious way of dealing with African Americans. And you'll come across the passage referring to Jews as swathy and guttural voiced aliens. And you'll see him refer to New York City's Chinatown as just, you know what, I don't even really want to repeat it. This is the type of language and derogatory views that make me sick, and this man is a monster. Plain and simple. As a result of his rampantly offensive views, the World Fantasy Convention decided in recent years to remodel their iconic award, which previously was based off of Lovecraft's likeness. After all, it's a pretty bad look when the guy who inspired your statuette would refer to some of your nominees as semi-human, and not in a cool epic fantasy way. It's back to painters with Moulin Rouge, baby, number four. Most people know of Henri de Toulouse La Rue from Baz Luhrmann's 2001 fever dream of a movie, Moulin Rouge, part of the iconic Red Curtain trilogy. As portrayed by John Leguizamo, Toulouse Zarek was an impish lout seduced by the green fairy of absinthe, and this is absolutely 100% accurate to the real man. The real artist was eventually broken by his addiction. His paintings, watercolors, prints, and posters found admirers in Van Gogh and Bernard, among countless others. 
but it clearly wasn't enough for the man. Nothing seemed to dull the veritable ache that poured from inside. He eventually came to love absinthe so much that he created his own cocktail with it, and he had a hollow walking stick made so that he could fill it to the brim with absinthe to go. For those of you that don't know, absinthe can reach over 60% alcohol percentage, and that's nowadays when things are restrained. Alcoholism caught up with Toulouse around age 36 when he died from cirrhosis. A reminder at this moment that art is a subject heavily laden with the topic of addiction, and that it is a disease. Always reach out to others for help because conquering the shame of addiction is the first step to conquering the addiction itself. We do recover, so. You know her name and you probably know her secrets, but everyone loves Frida, so she's number three. Frida Kahlo is most famous for her self-portraits, now considered a glamorous artist and a feminist by icon. Her characteristic art can be found on everything from handbags to pillows, sneakers, anything. Despite her often being considered a symbol of strength for many women, her self-portraits often show her at her weakest and most vulnerable. Kahlo had a tragic early life. According to biography, she came down with polio at age six, which withered her right leg and left her with a pronounced limp later in life, one that required she set her teenage years aside to recover from, leaving her isolated and friendless. Later, as a politically active teenager, she's critically injured in a horrific bus crash, in which she was impaled through her pelvis by one of the bus's iron handrails. These misfortunes left Kahlo unable to have children, and many of her self-portraits depict the artist in bed, surrounded by symbols of her chronic illness, but also the void of motherhood she could not fill. Academics such as Muso Dolores Olmeldo argue that images of Kahlo's favorite animals serve as a melancholy purpose, representing the children she was never able to have. Frida is remembered as being so strong because she overcame this emotional battle and accepted the reality of infertility, but did so without disregarding her own pain or femininity, or how she sometimes felt robbed of womanhood. Instead, she tried to pass on this message to other women who bore the same loss. Frida stands as a testament that not being able to produce a child does not make you any less of a woman. The dark side of dance and painting can be explained by Degas and the ballet, number two. Although popular in Hilaire Germain Edgar Degas's era, ballet had suffered a demoralizing fate by the late 1800s, one of an unseemly cabaret. See, in Paris, working as a ballerina also meant being a working girl, and the city's grand opera house, the Palais Garnier, was designed with this in mind. A luxurious appointed room located behind the stage called Foyer de la Danse was a place where the dancers would warm up before performances, but it also served as a men's club, where wealthy male subscribers to the opera could conduct business, socialize, and proposition ballerinas. The politics that played out in that foyer de la danse was a great interest to Degas. In fact, very few of his depictions are actually of the dance. Instead, the artist tends to hover behind the wings, backstage, in class, or at rehearsal. In works like Les Etoiles in 1878, he depicts a curtain call at the end of the performance with the curtsying dancer. Behind her, a man in elegant black tuxedo lurks in the wings, his face covered by a golden rod curtain. Such sinister figures also appear in works like Dancers, Pink and Green, 1890. Degas endeavored to capture the reality of ballet that lurked behind the, art the artifice of cool, carefully constructed choreography. Although the artist was known to reject advances from his models, his callousness manifested in other ways. To capture the physicality and discipline of the dancers, he demanded his models pose for hours at a time, enduring excruciating discomfort as they held their contorted poses. He wanted to capture his little monkey girls, as he called them, cracking their joints at the bar. I have perhaps too often considered woman as an animal, he once told painter Pierre Georges Yanoff in a moment of revealing honesty. And last but not least is number one, how James Joyce loved his wife. James Joyce defined modernism. He experimented with language, symbolism, and style. In Ulysses of 1922, he established parallels with Homer's Odyssey. In Finnegan's Wake 1939, he makes reality with a dream world. And in Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man 1916, he described his own intellectual development as if it was happening to someone else. It was all revolutionarily new. Except when he wasn't challenging literary establishment with his novels, he was penning some of the truly nastiest filth I have ever laid on to his wife Nora. In 1975, Joyce's letters were released to the world in a book entitled The Selected Letters of James Joyce. It's out of print now, but you can still find some copies out there and many of the letters live on in the interweb. Even though this is a quiet, shy guy who wouldn't even swear in public, turns out his lovely wife Nora, to quote, turned him into a beast. It apparently all started while he was in Dublin on business in 1909 and Nora started writing dirty letters to keep him away from working girls. I put this at the end of the video because I genuinely encourage you to take the time to look up the James Joyce love letters as there is not a single way for me to censor their content for you. They are that intense without even being that explicit. To give you an idea, he talks about some smells, tastes, angles, and Nora, oh, she didn't hold back either. James Joyce
Joyce prefaced one of his letters, darling don't be afraid at what I wrote, and that is a word of advice for now thousands who have read them, or intend to soon. Number 10, fire starter. Okay, what in the blazes happened? How does such a tragedy unfold in the first place? Let's start there, shall we? Well, it was a Sunday for starters. It was the 2nd of September in 1666. This was of course a long, long time ago, and even today it's hard to pinpoint what can cause a wildfire. Today it's more often than not gender reveal parties. That's the culprit for wildfires. But historians believe the great fire of 1666 started with a baker's oven. Yeah, specifically the baker of King Charles II, but we didn't know that for a while. I'll get to that later on. This blaze all began near London Bridge on Pudding Lane. So British, the most British sentence I've ever said in my entire life. But it didn't take long to spread. That's the thing about these wildfires. They, uh, they don't like stopping and they love wind. Number nine, old houses. Okay, we're talking about medieval London here, right? This is 1666, the time where every house in the city was constructed of old oak or timber. It was gross, right? It was all woody. It was just woody stuff. But to add more history to the mix, these houses often had walls covered in tar. Yeah, tar in order to keep the rain out. Now that worked, but in doing so, the fire spread a lot easier. Yeah, it was a little bit messier. Streets were narrow, houses were huddled up close to one another, and firefighters were not a thing, really, at the time at all. I mean, compared to what we have now, not even close. Citizens were told to always check for dangers in their homes, but one baker, he forgot to look. Number eight. Faraday. If we neglect this subject, then a hot season will give us a sad proof of the folly of our carelessness. Wise words from a wise man who seemed to be the main scientist who was actually trying to do something about the issue that was starting to rear its stinky head. Sir Michael Faraday was a famous scientist who performed an experiment where he dropped moistened pieces of paper into the Thames River that would sink below the surface. The paper pieces became invisible before even sinking like a couple inches down. He found that around bridges the clouds of sewage and nastiness were so thick that you could see it from the surface. He desperately pleaded with those in charge to do something, which was a few years before the Great Sink actually happened and proved him right. Just like any disaster movie where a dude tries to tell everyone to watch out and they completely ignore him. Number 7. Hot Season Like I mentioned before, the Great Stink was initiated in the June of 1858. Just as Mr. Faraday had warned of a heat wave that fell in London that directly also caused a dry spell which pretty much stopped the Thames River from actually flowing. Now with no way of cooling, the water got real hot and well, warmed up water thick with poo, well, that's no good for me and you. The overpowering smell of this water, plus the ground it had seeped into, rose up into the nostrils of every man and woman in London. It was so bad, rich people blamed it for sickness. It was so bad that people literally miles and miles away had ejected their lunches when the winds changed. It was so bad, Queen Victoria went on a cruise of the river and lasted literal minutes before ordering her boat back. It was bad. Number six, so what was in there? I'm so glad you asked, my little bees. Lots of stuff. See, after the river dried up and everything came up to the surface, then we could literally see what was there. Yay! It wasn't just human sewage either. Industrial waste, unalived animals, street runoff, animal droppings, the stuff that slaughterhouses don't want anymore, nasty spoiled food, and centuries and centuries of garbage. Ah, it's so yummy. Oh, and I didn't get to mention. You see, one of the methods used to maybe help clear the water was dumping a whole helpful god-sized handful of chloride of lime into the river. But guess what? It did nothing. In fact, it made things worse because it just made the river even more toxic and poisonous, which isn't good when it was lots of people's only source of drinking water. Number five, disease. Yes, the river was for the very poor, their only source of drinking water. I almost said fresh drinking water, <laughs> how silly. As you can imagine, ingesting these highly toxic waters was not good for people's health. And many diseases that are caused by interacting with such substances were showing up. Actually, it's believed that the multiple cholera outbreaks throughout London in 1831, 1832, and in 1854 were actually caused by the River Thames and London's horrid drinking water. And yes, I'd have to agree with that statement. 
Typhoid was another disease that affected whole swaths of people who just kept on going for a cup of that lovely river water. <clears throat> it's not entirely their fault. It was the best they had, and some people literally believed it was just the smell that caused sickness. So, you know, how could they know? Number four. Let's just cover it up first. Yes, the belief in smells causing diseases was an excuse to not do anything big to solve the problem. Scientific developments focused more on covering up the stench. People would go around covering their faces to get to work and walk the streets. Well, that won't help you when the river is literally described as, and I quote from the mayor at the time, Ahem. A Stygian pool reeking with ineffable and unbearable horror. Gosh, that's a good quote. You remember Queen Victoria's cruise on the River Thames? Yeah, I left out the fact that initially she tried to mask the scent of the river by stuffing her nose in a bouquet of flowers. But what Queen Victoria soon found out is that the stench was too strong. None can escape the stench. The stench is eternal. The stench is living. The stench cannot be stopped. Number three, maybe we should do something. Around the time of the Great Stink, Parliament moved to its new location. If you know about London, then you know that that new location is literally right on the banks of the River Thames. Now that the members of Parliament were literally right beside the Stanky Stink Ravine, literally all day, every day, they realized that it was an issue that they could no longer stomach. Because, you know, the poor and destitute that had been complaining about it, getting sick from it, and even meeting their ends from it, was not enough. Doing something drastic wasn't the first step. No, no. The initial plan, as it is with most rich overlords, that's not what they were, I'm just making a joke, was to just cover up the problem again. George, let's cover up our curtains in chloride of lime. That should do the trick. No, no, I, I still smell it. It's quite horrendous indeed. Parliament finally decided that maybe doing something drastic was a good idea. And it was. Number two. New and improved sewer system. All right, this is probably the best thing to come out of the Great Stink. Not that there were many great things. In fact, I'd say that there were. That this was really the only one. Yeah. But this one thing improved many things for the lives of Londoners. Joseph Bazalgett was the civil engineer placed in charge of designing the new system, and boy, did he do a good job. He basically saved the entire city. Joseph's sewers ran parallel of the River Thames and were actually carried all the way east, where it would eventually flow out into the river again, but in a place where it actually did flow out into the sea. He also developed water treatment plants along the new sewer system to clean up the nastiness. He created embankments along the river that would help stop the waste continuing to build up even further, and he even came up with other ways for the city to get fresh drinking water that they could be using. He revolutionized the whole of London's sewers, which cost quite the pretty penny. Worth it in my opinion because they pretty much use the basis of this system to this day. Number one, it's actually pretty clean now, sort of. The advancements in the city's sewage and the cleaning up of the river has honestly gotten much better. So much so that in 2021, the Zoological Society of London released a report on the status of the River Thames that showed that seals, sharks, and seahorses had actually returned to the waters with the cleaner and healthier fish that also came back to these waters. I don't think that's referring to the part of the river that it's actually within London, but, but the nature of the river as the city's dumping ground didn't just affect the one part of it. It spread all throughout the river, which is a long, long river, by the way affecting not just humans, but the whole ecological world that interacted with the river. Just one of the many ways we, as a species, have kind of messed things up. But hey, we usually try and find a way to fix it. We're a work in progress, okay? Just like the cleanliness of my apartment. With scalps so oily they could star in grease, it's no wonder lice was everywhere. You know what? I will give them a little bit more credit. It is true, after a certain point of not using shampoo, even the straightest of thin hair can regulate its oil levels. So their scalps probably weren't the worst, but maybe they were rocking some hella dandruff. Also, as I mentioned, lice. Say you're somehow living a medieval life healthily, being whatever you are in the castle. You're making a living, you're not sick, and nobody wants to tie you to a chair and dunk you underwater. Even if you've managed that, 
You still have lice. Bugs were everywhere, man. All kinds of them. On you, in your room, in your food. Nowhere was safe. Lice was such a way of life that people treated appointments to get deloused in pretty much the same way people treat appointments for a haircut today. Maybe an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. People in the Middle Ages and medieval times took lice to their grave, living a life of itch, 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 itch. No one likes having rats and mice in their house. Unfortunately for castle dwellers, the dark, cold living quarters within the castle afforded the perfect breeding ground and lifestyle for plenty of rodents and bugs, carrying diseases that could have meant the end for any of the castle's residents. Name something grosser than a non-ventilated stone behemoth full of unwashed bodies. So why no washy-washy of the body body? Why is that so difficult to accomplish? Jump in a river or something, right? Wrong. Leeches, disease, death. Also, hot baths are preferred. Regular and incredibly convenient bathing as we know it today did not exist in Europe until the late 19th century, so Europeans in the 13th, 14th, and 15th hundreds were not vibing with that idea. Firstly, water was precious, especially during sieges, and the work was so hard and manual and labor intensive that you would build up a sweat the moment you got out of the bathtub. So bathing was seen as a waste of time. I mean, wash off two weeks worth of grime and one little batch of sweat made that a waste. Your bath water is probably brown, dude. Still seems kind of worth it, but secondly, the trouble of setting up a bath just didn't seem to be worth it. No running water so if you wanted a hot bath, you had to boil the water yourself over a fire, carry hot water buckets upstairs to the bathtub, fill the bathtub and not spill the hot water on yourself, get the temperature right, put the soap in if you had any, get in, wash before it cooled, get out, dry, put your clothes back on, and then you have to bail out the entire bathtub by hand with a bucket and find a window to toss the water out of onto some unsuspecting servant. So yeah, it was a lot of work. Coming into number eight, we have men actually stay warmer than women. If you have ever seen a group of guys out in the middle of the cold or a crazy cold snowy winter and seen them wearing shorts, this guy, well guess what, leave them alone, they're fine because men can actually stay warmer than women, most often. You know, of course there are exceptions just like everything on this list, but men hold more muscle than women typically and that makes them hold more heat, so they have a lower resting body temperature. Now doctors of osteopathic medicine have recorded this. This makes sense to me because whenever I have cuddled with a female partner or been with friends, they are always freezing and I am always burning up. Don't get me wrong, I am a cuddler guys, but damn, sometimes this guy needs some air. Coming in at number seven, we have men can slow down the aging process. How do you ask? Because we're freaking superheroes, broskies. Okay, not really. I don't want it to seem like my male ego is that big, because it's not. But from the neck up, men typically tend to age not as quickly as women do. Now, why is this? It's because men lose collagen density more slowly than women, which basically means that their skin resists wrinkles and sagging a bit more as they age older. Dermatologists, however, claim that men and women both lose about 1% of collagen per year after the age of 20. But women's process can speed up after they hit menopause. I will say, even though this is what the studies show, it doesn't mean that men don't find ways to mess it up. Because men are usually more lax with their skincare, not all, but a fair few, this messes with their natural skin advantage. So if you're a guy out there who isn't using sunscreen, do it. And if you uh, want to start taking care of your skin, it's never too late. And if you already are, then uh, up top, buddy. Coming in at number six, we have a men have a more stable base. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, let me tell you. Women tend to be smaller than men, but of course, once again, there's always exceptions, so you just don't freak out at me. But even when men and women are generally the same height, men usually have the larger and wider feet. Although women typically usually have the higher arch, a shallower first toe, shorter ankle length, a smaller instep, but a larger calf. Not for this guy though, my calves are the only part of my body that I am extremely content with. Wanna see me in heels? Well then you better play your cards right. Anyway, in short, in short, men usually have longer and wider feet, but in case you were wondering, the old saying that men with huge feet usually have large, you know what? Sorry guys, that isn't true. That's just a lie that a bunch of big footy guys made up in the day. Probably more for themselves. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have men aren't always surging with testosterone. Early in life, men will get two surges of testosterone. One tells their genitals to form into the male genitalia, and the other is believed to implant their male pattern on their brains. From the early years, little boys and girls have relatively the same amount of testosterone in their bodies. It isn't until puberty that the males have a surge in the hormone. The average amount of testosterone in men ages 40 and younger, which is a huge range, are 350 to 1,000 nanograms a deciliter, which if you were to put all of that in a shot glass, it would barely fog the bottom of the glass. So there you go. As much as we think it's just, as much as we think it's just flowing through us all the freaking time, it's not. So there you go. Yes, men have testosterone, but we're not running on it like Jolt Cola or anything. And if you know what Jolt Cola is, 
power to you. It's just there, and of course, the hormone can fluctuate depending on physical and mental health. So once again, guys, Take care of yourselves, both physically and mentally. Coming in at number four, we have men have thicker skins. Yeah, so if you make fun of us or even yell bad things at us, that means we don't hurt as much as women do. <laughs> yeah, right. As long as you have a beating heart and ears, words can hurt anyone. And don't forget that. But physically, men actually do have thicker skin than women. Due to the testosterone that flows through our system, even though it's not much all the time, in our older years, which is more than women naturally have, this makes our skin just a bit thicker. Androgen testosterone stimulation causes an increase in skin thickness which is why men's skin is typically 25% thicker than women's. And most often, the texture is also tougher too. Probably, once again, because we don't like after our skin as much as we should. Boys, come on, what are we doing? Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have men who can also get yeast infections. The itchy, embarrassing, and annoying infections don't just happen to our female friends, but guys, we can get them too. And guess what? It's in the same nether regions and are actually common in men who are uncircumcised, heavier, or prone to excessive sweating. Usually it shows up in a rash and can sometimes have an overly discharge as well. So one more thing. This is for everyone watching. Personal hygiene is not just to be clean, it is for your health as well. So please, like I said earlier, you only get one body. Take care of it. Coming in at number two is one that we may not want to admit here, guys, but I'm sorry, it's just freaking true. Men snore more than women. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine reported that 40% of all men are habitual snorers. Typically, men tend to store more body fat in the abdomen area if they are going to have an excess amount of body fat, and this can lead to more loud snoring as they breathe out of their mouths and noses, where 24% of all women were reported to be habitual snorers. So the statistics, you know, they show that we are the, we are the bigger snorers. In the end, this one doesn't mean much to me because my family used to rent a small cottage up on Lake Huron, and let me tell you, that entire structure would shake from the sound of both my mother and father sawing logs in their bedroom all freaking night. Yeah, and it kept me up all night too. When have I ever kept them up like that? Answer, never, because even as a baby, I was a freaking saint. So what the hell, guys? And finally, at number one, we have men do actually have larger Adam's apples. Both men and women have Adam's apples. Now, what are they though? Well, these interior bulges are usually made up of thyroid cartilage. The only purpose of these is to protect those lovely vocal cords of ours and whether you sing or not. This cartilage is also responsible for the higher pitch in people's voices, but during the teenage years, the angle this cartilage sits at changes, forming an Adam's apple, and thus dropping or breaking a person's voice. But the angle is usually smaller in men, which is what gives us usually a larger bulge in the neck as well as a lower voice. 